Computer. Okay, we're recording now, so um, welcome again. Uh, this time we'll be reviewing the uh, James Hazelton video. Um, we were meant to do this last week, but I came down with a great a migraine. And look would have it, I've been coming down with a chest infection since Thursday, but um, I'll just soldier on. Uh, we have a couple participants today, so like what we'll do is like, before we delve into like the video itself, um, we'll just have like maybe like a brief 30 to 60 second introduction for each person. So um, Daniel, if you were to go first, then Travis, Nate. Uh, then Brigham, then Schuler, and then Alex. Um, and it, you know, it's like it, we we have international representation. I'm in Ireland. There's a bunch of people from the U.S. and Nate is actually from the Philippines. So I think we can actually apply for a grant for the uh, minority status of so many of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, uh, so like Daniel, for those who may be wondering who you are, like uh, your interest in apologetics and all that jazz, and we'll yeah. Uh, wait. All right. Sounds good. So yeah, my name's Daniel Stark. Um, Right now, um, I'm from, well, I, right now I live in um, Alabama. Um, I'm currently looking for a job in data analytics for its worth, so that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, I've always been really interested in Mormon history, um, theology, uh, philosophy, and apologetics. Um, I just love talking about this stuff, so, you know, I heard that there was going to be this online chat about, you know, Sola Scriptura. You know, down here I live with a lot of uh, evangelicals, Protestants, so... I, this is also a subject I've talked about, so uh, yeah, I'm just interested in joining in. Thanks for joining us. Travis? The infamous um, Travis Anderson? I'm Travis Anderson. I'm the infamous Travis Anderson. I get blocked from most Facebook pages. By the way, James Anderson, Travis says hi. I get I get uh, accused of, of an abundance of aggression. I'm, an, uh, I'm a practicing attorney in the state of Texas, and uh, I've been engaged in apologetics and uh, social media interactions, helping and uh, assisting the missionaries for you know, better than 20 years. And so I have a pretty, pretty good, pretty great love for this kind of engagement with uh, those who oppose our faith. Uh, Nate, if you want to give a uh, very brief uh, introduction. Looks like he's did you freeze my I'm Daniel Lyle. Um, so, um, <laughs> it's it's kind of breaking up. Um, yeah. I'm Nathaniel Lyle. I'm from um, uh, yeah, it's, it's your, there. Your, your audio is pretty bad. So, like, maybe if you were to like um, end and come back again, um, I'll uh -huh. put you in. Um, while we do that, uh, Brigham, want to give a uh, introduction? And sorry for everyone that's not the Brigham Young. So, um. yeah, uh, in that resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Brigham. Um, I, uh, I was a missionary not too many months ago, but now I'm home um, in between college semesters, currently studying psychology. Um, I've been very interested in like LDS church history and theology um, ever since I was a missionary during COVID and had lots of extra time to study it. So this is exciting for me to really gain a better understanding of interacting with other theologies and doctrines and things like that. Uh, Alex, if you want to go, because I think you're muted, but if you want to give an intro, there you go. Um, yeah, I can give my introduction. So I'm Alex Green. I'm from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, like um, Brigham, I also just got off my mission a few months ago. And um, I mean, the main interest I have with apologetics in general is um, I just like being able to understand, you know, the doctrine. I, I like being able to understand God's word. And um, 
I'm really interested in Sola Scriptura specifically because um, that's an argument that I got all the time on my mission. I served in Texas. Um, and that was something that a lot of people always said was, you know, you only need the Bible. And if you have any more than the Bible, then it's not true. And so that was something that um, was talked about a lot on the mission. Cool. And finally, uh, Elder Allen. So my first name is so whack. It's actually Skyler. So it is super weird. It's strange, but I'm currently a missionary serving in the MIM or the Missouri Independence Mission. And actually Robert and Travis got me interested in this, just seeing like what you guys do on internet. Just kind of, like you guys are like just giants. And so just even being on this call kind of blows my mind. And so just seeing like how we can defend our faith and like offer like faithful responses, like really inspired me with my family, some of them leaving the church and wanting to like help my cousins have faithful responses to um, their doubts and concerns really was a pain. I'd say. Cool. Um, Elder Uh, everyone can see this. Um, Hazel Plan is the kind of scripture closed. Got it. Yep, I can see it. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, I'm going into this largely blind. I think some other people will be as well, but as I said, Travis made a uh, transcription. Um, and there's a purgatory. I'm sure that's an indulgence in of itself. Um, it seems like the first section is basically an assumption of there has to be a closed canon. It's questionable if there's an open canon. So, We'll probably just uh, spend like the next like 60 to 90 minutes, you know, the entire session just addressing this particular issue and hopefully we'll have like a part two or part three on um I think he um, critiques like the LDS interpretation of some passages in passing like 1 Corinthians 15, 29 and baptism for the dead. So it might be good like to have a follow up session, like say hermeneutics and interpretation and all that stuff. But yeah, so that's that's the plan. So like um, I'll be stopping and starting, but like if there's any place you want to start and stop, just say it as well. So uh, that's that's all cool. Sounds good. Awesome. <laughs> He's a kind of scriptures close with the 66 books of the Bible. TLDR, no. So recently I've been asked by uh, many LDS friends, or a few at least. Oh, it should be known that he's a pastor or a reverend or a minister in Utah, so like, uh, and he's a Protestant. Um, Travis, do you know if he's a Calvinist or like is he just like a run-the-mill uh, Protestant type? I don't believe he is Reformed. Um, if I recall correctly, I don't think that he follows a Reformed tradition. Okay, so he's not too... Okay, so... Yeah. I think that he is... I think that he... I, I read it. I read a bio on him. Um, he got his. I know he he became an ordained minister in 2011. Started a church in uh, in St. George, Utah. That church has since, I think, shut down and merged with another church. I think he still does pastoral duties with another church, but okay. um, currently so, so works he, as so I think a mail carrier. If he's actually taught about the issue, <clears throat> which I doubt he has, he would be more Arminian than Reformed. So it, it appears so. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. LDS friends on the internet, a very important question. They're wanting me to prove that the 66 books of the Bible are it as God's word. That there's okay. This is me, and feel free, like, if you want to like add something. But that's an excellent question because according to the Protestant, the Bible, Sola Scriptura, teaches that um, all it's formally sufficient. I eat the 66 books of the Bible taken as a whole. The concept of Tota Scriptura is formally sufficient for. Uh, godliness and doctrine and so forth, you know, as well as matters of salvation and so forth. So if Sola Scriptura is actually taught in the Bible, the uh, essential matter or material uh, necessary for Sola Scriptura, such as the, um, will, will be there in 
using the historical grammatical method of exegesis. So you can't really appeal to like external sources of authority, like say tradition or ecclesiastical history, as if that's the only source, because if that's the case, functionally you're putting these external authorities on the same power, functionally speaking, as the 66 books of the Bible to prove this dogmatic point, i.e. the cessation of special or public revelation and the 66 books of the Bible being it, i.e. Because, uh, let me actually quote, um, and then we can, uh, I know this is like, um, old hat if you follow my stuff, but according to like say Protestants, um, for sola scriptura to be true, there must first be tota scriptura, i.e. all 66 books of the Bible must be inscripturated or written. Um, you know, and this is admitted by the likes of, say, James White and others like Bill Webster and David Cain. But here's the thing. It means that there's no passage of the Bible, no verse, no chapter, no paragraph that in its historical grammatical context can actually teach sola scriptura. Uh, James White actually once wrote, quote, Protestants do not assert that sola scriptura is a valid concept in times of revelation. How could it be? since the rule of faith to which it pints was at the very time coming into being. And that's his uh, review in response to a Catholic apologist, Steve Ray, a review in rebuttal of Steve Ray's article, Why the Bereans Rejected Sola Scriptura. But as another person noted, Robertson Genis, quote, By this submission, White has unwittingly proven that scripture, i.e. the Bible, does not teach Sola Scriptura. For if it cannot be a valid concept in times of revelation, i.e. the inscripturation and production of the New Testament texts, how can scripture teach such a doctrine since scripture was written precisely when divine oral revelation was still being produced? Scripture cannot contradict itself, since both the first century Christian and the 21st century Christian cannot extract different interpretations from the same verse. Thus, whatever was true about scripture then must also be true today. If the first Christians did not and could not extract sola scripture from scripture, such as, say, Matthew 4, 1-11, 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, Revelation 22, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, uh, because oral revelation was still existent, then obviously those verses cannot, in principle, be teaching sola scriptura, and thus we cannot interpret them as teaching it either. So, um, yeah. So, I'm oh, sorry, I keep on. No, I, I was just going to say that uh, the, my my issue with a lot of the way that, that he begins the video is, I mean, first of all, a lot of people, then it's a couple people. And my, my particular concern and issue with, with a lot of the way he phrases things is what exactly was the question that was asked? And the question that he that he's asking is such a vague question. But but he, like like you said, Robert, he's not really identifying what exactly it is that he's going to lay out in a in a thesis, for example. So you know, sola scriptura, what would you need to do to prove that? So typically when, you, when you're making an argument, you would lay out what the foundational tenets and principles that are required to formulate that argument would be. And so what he does is he simply says, you know, I'm, I'm you know, asked why the Bible, why the 66 texts alone are sufficient without providing any exact clarity as to how exactly that would be proven and what exactly he would do. So for example, just as you said, you, you're going to have to support it from the text and it's not going to have to, it's, it, it's going to have to be more than simply an interpretational argument. It's going to require some kind of biblical hermeneutics and, and exegesis of the texts that demonstrate that this is not only a doctrine found specifically in those texts, but also is clearly taught within the, the, the confines of those 66 books, which of course you can't do. Yeah, something I actually kind of wanted to add, I think I go along with everything where it's like, oh, you have to prove that, like, you know, like when Paul was saying, like, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and they all always go to be like that, like, oh, yeah, that's true, soul scriptura, but then you can, the first thing you'll be like, well, when Paul was writing that, other scripture hadn't been written yet, so soul scriptura was not a thing when he was writing that, so it's kind of like you're just sort of like going back on that. And, and, also, and also, just just because that's a good point when it comes to the Second Timothy right. three text. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, Paul is teaching solo scripture in that verse. That would mean that you don't need the sixty six books. You need like sixty six less whatever was in between the pastoral epistles and the final book in the New Testament for solo scripture to be operative. Which, of course, is nonsense because solo scripture requires that the totality of scripture, i.e., the sixty six books. Or, or what's formally sufficient, not like 65 or 60 or whatever. So that's a good point, you know. Um, all Paul is saying is like, in the context, is scripture, and he doesn't actually define the limits of scripture. He just says scripture is god breed, Theopneustos, and a very weak word, Ophelmas, it's profitable, you know, for all these things, you know. Um, so, yeah, sorry, but that, that's a good point you're bringing up there. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and the one other thing I want to add is that I was actually, and I'm not going to name any names because I don't know if this guy would appreciate it if I did name his name because he he actually is um a uh, a kind of a Protestant um apologist, but he's been he I know he went back and forth about thinking about becoming Catholic. And when he was thinking about some of his thoughts about this, again, this isn't more of this Catholic, but I still think this when he was saying this thing still applies though. Is he said I'm going to uh, make him a cool quote on this. He said, "I've been thinking more about solo scriptura lately." Even if the doctrine can be successfully articulated in a way that's not self-speeding, Sola Scriptura entails that divine inspiration has a stopping point. The problem that uh, the Protestants face, by my light, is that the stopping point they arrive seems arbitrary. Why stop the Gospels and the Epistles? Like, seriously, why? Like, it's just sort of like saying, like, like yeah, like the, um, at least this is the way I look at Mormonism, a really key way I look at Mormonism, is that the Bible is constantly adding new light knowledge throughout the whole thing, and then the Sul Scriptura says that, okay, for some reason, it stopped the first century AD. And I think, and again, you could argue this, but this is my personal perspective, is that Mormonism at its core is essentially a rejection of that. It's saying, no, that the light knowledge continues to keep going on. And that's a big reason why a lot of these evangelicals are like, oh, you worship a different Jesus, you worship a different, you know, whatever, because our understanding has, well, at least, again, I'm saying this from a Mormon's perspective, but our understanding keeps going. It adds on these new things. It's kind of like, again, a lot of the arguments that they make about us are the same things that Jews make towards them. They're like saying, why are you adding all this other stuff? Like, you know, why are you adding, you know, all the, and then they'll say like, why are you looking at our scriptures saying they're prophesying about Jesus? Like, I mean, you know, why they, they're doing that kind of stuff. And then like the, I don't know if there are any other models that Jews to do that. I know this um, Sadducees would say, oh, all we need is the first five books of Moses. It says it right there. You know, <laughs> why are you adding to that? So again, like I always thought that the, again, the, core premise of Mormonism, in my mind, is that that kind of, it does not like necessarily a stopping point. The um, continuation, keep, the um, understanding keeps going. Yeah, and here's the thing, like, uh, and you hit the uh, nail on the head. One of the key tenets, um, you know, one of the essential building blocks of solo scripture to be true is a cessation of public revelation. Not necessarily, like, say, private revelation and so forth, but, like, public revelation with the uh, death of the last apostle and the inscripturation of the final book in the New Testament. But here's the thing, one, even if that's the case, that does not actually mean Sola Scriptura is true, because Catholics and Eastern Orthodox would agree public revelation ceased as well. And here's the thing, they're more consistent because they have a basis for that, you know, uh, like the Magisterium or the Ecumenical Councils and so forth. The Bible doesn't teach it, you know. Um, um, so, and even, so like, even if it's true, like, it doesn't necessarily imply Sola Scriptura. It's one of the essential building blocks. But as I said, like, there's no passage, you know, I'm talking about even like a singular verse, but I'm talking about an entire passage or what have you, that actually teaches that there would be a cessation of public revelation with the death of the last apostle. You know, I think we all know about like Revelation 22 and don't add to the book, you know, and all that stuff. Um, that's old hat, and I think that's easy to refute it. But like, e even like some of the other passages that they point to, if, if they were to be consistent, would actually blow uh, blow up on them, like the Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 text, or Jude 3, like, um, there's a number of Protestants who will claim, like, the faith in Jude 3 is actually oral tradition, not in scripted revelation. For instance, one Protestant scholar, uh, William Rene Wilson II, in a recent book, Jude's Apocalyptic Eschatology as Theological Exclusivism, really fancy title, uh, from like uh, Fontes Press 2021, pages 20 to 21, states that they're often identified as later Catholic traditionalism. Jude's fate once delivered to all the saints, verse 3, and his appeal to the words of the apostles, verse 17, mirror emphasis on delivered tradition. 2 Thessalonians 2 15, 3 6, 1 Corinthians 15 3, where the oral inspired revelation was on the same level of authority at that time as written revelation. Apistus, the fate as a body of teaching, Galatians 1 21, 23, and appeals to apostolic authority, 1 Corinthians 9 1, 2 Corinthians 11 13, found in the early Pauline material, circa AD 50 to 56. So e even these passages that they often appeal to, like say Jude 3 or Hebrews 1 1 2, if you were to take it to their logical conclusion, uh, would actually refute, not support some of the key tenets that they believe in as well. And I do apologize if I'm coughing up a lot and stuff like that. Um, chest infection, so I'm not pronouncing words pro. <laughs> yeah, and uh, something I'd like to add real quick is, um, you know, I've been reading the Apocrypha lately, and it's really interesting because I know that there are some books in the Apocrypha that were included in like the Old Testament at one point, 
And then they changed it and just put it in the Apocrypha. And, you know, something else that I think really disproves Sola Scriptura is that, um, you know, at one point the Apocrypha was included with the Bible canon and most Protestants accepted it as well up until like, um, until the 1800s. And, um, you know, it's just, they just, it was still changing for so many years, just which books were canon, which books were not. Well, I think they would say like, well, they did include like some of the books in translations like the King James, but like as secondary or like uh, helpful aids. But even if you were to push it back, like one of the interesting things about the Dead Sea Scrolls that's often overlooked is Jerome uh, um, did not want to include the Apocrypha in his canon, if you will, for like a while. And there was like a whole debate between him and Damascus and others about this. But one of the arguments, and the Protestant reformers went with this when it comes to the Old Testament canon they held to, would be, well, there's no Semitic, i.e. Hebrew or Aramaic originals to any of these books. They're only in Greek, so they're clearly Hellenistic works, they're not Semitic, and they're clearly generally apocrypha. And yet, since then, since like 1947, at least two books have been attested in Aramaic or a Semitic language, Tobit and um, Sirach. And there seems to be like one strand of uh, Pharisaic taught that actually accepted Sirach as being God breed scripture as well. And there's um, some debate as to like um, whether some of these books, which we would classify as being on the uh, part of the Apocrypha, were actually, um, in terms of the limits of the canon, being accepted as on par with the other books as well. So there, that's that's a debate as well. Like, um, I don't want to t turn this into like a canon debate, but at the same time, um, if you're going to be claiming sole scripture, i.e. the 66 books, you have a canon. How do you know which books are actually part of that canon? You know, and why why include Jude? You know, or why include Revelation? That was the dispute until like the 9th century in Eastern Christianity. That's why it doesn't appear in the uh, liturgical texts of the Eastern churches, although they do accept Revelation, you know. Um, and why not go with Luther? You know, he won, he he almost threw out the book of James until Melanchthon actually told him, well, no, there's this interpretation of James too that's floating about that doesn't necessarily imply the Roman Catholic interpretation, you know, of our justification. So Yeah. And it's kinda of like that meme where it's like it says like, you know, where it's like one side is it says like scripture's infallible and the other side is like it's like the seven books Luther threw out, and then Luke is like sweaty like <sighs> like he just can't take it. So it's like even Luther like didn't totally believe in the infallibility of scripture maybe it was like the scripture that he approved of or whatever but like it was kind of like he and they talk about picking and choosing but they're that and i know that luther who was basically like their founder he was picking and choosing like pretty significantly when it came to like certain books he took out yeah i, I know like a counter will be well you know lds don't accept the apocrypha in their canon that's true but like i understand like say the canon of the Old Testament, but our understanding of scripture and canon are not the present understanding of it. Like, we have section 91 that actually states that at least some of the original of what we call the Apocrypha is god breathed scripture. So, like, if you have the spirit, you can actually discern that. And what's rather interesting is, like, in Matthew 27, 39 to 43, it, it, it uses the wisdom of Solomon as a prophecy of the crucifixion. Uh, in Matthew, I'll just read it. This is from the NRSV. Matthew 27, 39 to 43. Those who passed by derided him, Christ, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants you, for I said, I am God's son. So, Matthew and the Jewish opponents are interpreting the crucifixion of Jesus um, as a prophecy, either ironically from their perspective or a true prophecy from Matthew's perspective. But where does this come from? You know, you could say it's from the book of Psalms, but like it doesn't provide a lot of the material here. It actually comes from the wisdom of Solomon, uh, chapter 2, 17 to 22, which I'll read as well. Let us see if his words are true, and thus test what will happen at the end of his life. For if the righteous man is God's child, or the son of God, he will help him, and will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. Let us test him with insult and torture, so that we might find out how gentle he is, and make trial of his forbearance. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for, according to what he says, he will be protected. Thus they reasoned. 
but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the price for a blameless soul. So here, you actually have Matthew in the New Testament using the wisdom of Solomon, but using it as a prophecy of the crucifixion. He's not just simply using it because like, it uses language that's contemporary currents here. He's referring to historical events merely. He's using it as a fulfillment of a prophecy. <laughs> So I think that's significant. Um, Gary Mishuda, who's a Catholic apologist, has done a, a lot of very good work on this particular issue. Uh, for those who watch this video and want to delve more into, like, say, the apocrypha. Um, well, and that's that's the whole that's the whole. I, I think for me, the over the overarching argument, and I think that for missionaries, it's something that they need to be understanding. Is that a lot of guys like this. In fact, James Hazelton, one of the things that he does pretty commonly is he'll reach out to missionaries and he'll. He'll usually start off with a, hey, how's it going? I'm a nice guy. And then he cuts into, you know, typical anti-arguments, you know, assessing, you know, uh, attacking the characters of the leaders of the church and things like that. But ultimately he goes into some of these, these issues, but they're all, they're all begging the question and things like that. But the overarching, the overarching issue is that scripture exists, but who interprets it? So even if there was a closed canon of scripture, it's you're still going to need an authorized person in, in the form of a prophet. So simply having a closed canon of scripture, even if that's true, you'd still have to have an authorized servant from God to interpret it and to bring the texts into the modern era appropriately and contextually. So that's what we see happening in the New Testament texts. So when prophets who are currently living engage in that kind of activity where they draw from the old texts and they are taking them into the modern era and interpreting them in relevant ways that becomes scripture as well so the argument would be is even if there is sola scriptura who interprets it and don't their interpretations thereafter become scripture so it it's a it's a self-defeating argument from that perspective and when it comes to say the need for like a living interpreter one look at Protestantism over the last 500 years. They've been divided since day one about the nature of the Eucharist. Luther wanted to go to war about it. Uh, and then they had the whole uh, colloquy at Marburg, you know, uh, where Luther got his little pen knife and put down, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, in his debate with Zwingli. And then Calvin came in and said, a proper understanding of baptism, the Lord's Supper is essential to salvation. Baptism itself, like baptism of regeneration, You'll have like loads of Protestants who claim baptism regeneration is a theological error or even a rank heresy. And then you have like Lutherans and Anglicans who actually believe, no, the Bible is clear about it. By the way, they're correct on that point. Or like the nature of justification, can justification be lost? The whole Arminian Calvinist debate uh, about like the nature of the atonement and the extent of the atonement and the nature of depravity and the nature of grace. Um, so even, even like when just like looking at the uh, debates between Protestantism over 500 years. Um, they're not minor issues, you know, like, you know, should he just sing the book of uh, exclusive samity for the hymn book or not? No, we're talking about matters of salvation. And also, like, you have some Protestants like William Lane Craig, who I'm sure some of you have heard of, you know, the very famous philosopher. He doesn't believe that Jesus had a, uh, Jesus has two wills. He believed Christ when he had one will. And he admits that it was condemned as heresy at one of the ecumenical councils, the same one that condemned um, Pope Honorius and Sergius. I think it's the fifth or sixth ecumenical, the sixth ecumenical council, I think. But even then, like he says, it doesn't matter because solo scripture, and from my understanding of scripture, Christ only had one will, even in the hyperstatic hyperst um, union with the Logos and the uh, impersonal human nature of Jesus and so forth. Well, and then it becomes an entirely academic argument, which again, as, as we go through this more, that's kind of what Hazleton, he tries to draw on it. I don't think he's qualified to do it, though. Uh, Daniel, quick, are you about to say something? No, real quick, and I, and I know we're about to be really new to the video, but I just want to add this in real quick, just a little bit of defense. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Well, I, want, like, I want this to be a resource, so even if yeah, like yeah. it's like 10 sessions, we only yeah. get to like one, one or two minutes, it's yeah. fine. You know, it, so It's I'm more like fun than anything else. Yeah, I just want to add this in just because I'm at least kind of in defense, like, you know, the concept of, like, oh, you always need, you need, like, an action interpreter. Um, even in, like, you know, Mormonism, or, well, you know, really, Latter-day Saint, if you want to be really specific, or, I mean, sort of the other denominations have it too, but, um, or Catholicism or whatever, there are still significant differences in interpretation of scripture. Even now, even, like, even if you look in church history, you can see that, you know, 
there were some very significant different interpretations of scripture. And even now, like you, if you talk to some other person, even LDS people have very different interpretations. So just having a, um, a prophet in and of itself doesn't necessarily like, it's like saying, Oh, or a Pope or whoever, like, it's not saying, Oh, like this is like that. But I do think at least lead you in a more unified direction, at least, at least closer to there. Like, so at least a, a better understanding. So it gets more insight into it. Does it answer everything? Like really, there's some, still some big questions that, um, we still debate over in the um, LDS But here's state. the thing. We have a source we can actually go to, and even if it takes a while, we can actually know we can get objective, not subjective, definitive answers. The same way it comes to Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. A Protestant doesn't have that. And Travis Morgan, who's an idiot, hi Travis, just doesn't seem to get this, and many others don't seem to get this as well. But you're correct. Um, it's like the joke. Five Jews, 15 interpretations of the same passage of the Bible, you'll have, like, LDS, and maybe, like, when we discuss, like, say, Ezekiel 37 and Isaiah 29, why I don't think their prophecies, the Book of Mormon, and, like, maybe some here do, you know, uh, we'll see that kind of difference. But, and I think you were hinting at it's like, when it comes to, say, having prophets and apostles, or even, like, if you're a Catholic and you have the magisterium with the papacy or what have you, um, the, the debate will be actually much more limited. You know, it's like, we don't need a perfect interpretation of every single passage of the Bible or the Book of Mormon, but we actually have objective, from an objective source, an objective living source, answers as to, is baptism necessary for salvation? Is total depravity true? Did Christ die for every single person? You know, and then with these definitive answers, you know, it kind of limits the scope of the debate, if you will. You know? Well, more or less, there is there is also something else to say, is they don't always agree with each other. They, they debate oh, yeah, with sure. each other, too. So there is like there is the kind of thing, but it does it does it does give a lot of insight. I will say that it gives a lot of significant insight that wouldn't be there. But even then, they definitely have significant disagreements. And even beyond that, you know, not even just the ones now. The way they interpret it, you know, early days of the church, there's some significant difference in interpretation. But um, but yeah, it does. I will agree. Like yeah, it does give a lot of more insight and a lot more understanding that if you didn't have them at all, that that is true. I mean, like, I, I agree, like, we don't have, like, say, 100% answers and everything, and sometimes, like, there's inconsistencies, but the, the pound for pound or the density of issues we have is nowhere equivalent to, like, Protestantism, and unlike, say, the last 500 years of Protestantism, at least we can get different answers at times. They can't. They have to appeal completely to subjective uh, magisteria. Yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah. I keep muting myself. We're 27 seconds into this, so we should be finished by 2076. Yeah. <laughs> no more that the canon is closed. Um, I'm doing this video uh, simply because when I try to answer questions like this, it's kind of a long answer, but I rarely am able to get through even the first point or two before I'm uh, interrupted, and I just can't really... Because the first point you make, James, is anti-biblical. There's no passage in the Bible that teaches special revelation would cease with the death of last apostle. I, I, and keep in mind, this is like an essential building block here of Sola Scriptura. Uh, if Sola Scriptura is true, you'd expect... On this course, the biblical altars were so stupid, so sloppy, they did not actually foresee this. It's like, oh guys, should we actually tell them that, like, um, you know, special revelation will cease when the final book, or like, when one of us dies off? You know, it's like, no... Nah, we, we, we'll need, we, we'll need them figure that yeah. one out, you know. Well, we've, we've got Hebrews that says that there's not going to be any more prophets after Christ. Yeah, I can't. Right. I want to add. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I want to add something. And actually, this is actually from Joseph. I actually, was re when, um, rereading Joseph with Stone Rolling. This is actually an interesting uh, part in it that kind of goes to it. It says, um, and this is when Joseph was, he was asked about, um, um, Richard Bushman's talking about when Joseph was asked about, um, you know, about what distinguishes the doctrine of Mormonism. It says, Joseph told him, and this has pissed off a lot of evangelicals, but I guess that's what we're here for. It says, Joseph told him that we believe the Bible and they do not. It, it was the power of the Bible that Joseph and the visionary sought to recover, not getting it from the ministry. They looked for it themselves. So, like, again, it's the concept that, like, that, you know, that Sola Scriptura isn't biblical. And that's basically what I think he was, Joseph was referring to when he was asked that question. Yeah, and amen to that. By the way, Butchman is actually a really lovely guy. He's like, I met him last year at the MHA conference. Uh, you know, and he, he loves Irish people, so we kind of got on very well. <laughs> um, but yeah, 
that's that's a bit random. But I met Richard Bushman, so that's my claim to fame in Mormon history, as well as working in Mormon history. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right. Like it, it, it does piss off evangelicals. But here's the thing, uh, and this is why I named my blog Scriptural Mormonism. Biblical Christianity is better is more consistently found in Mormonism than Protestantism, you know, as well as Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And you, if you disagree, come find me. But Here's the thing, um, nowhere in the Bible does it teach like some of the essential building blocks of Sola Scriptura, like the cessation of public revelation. And I'll challenge anyone, including, hi again, Travis, to actually provide a text and exegate it that's consistent with the principles of Sola Scriptura, while at the same time arguing that that particular book is indeed part of the canon. Because if you're going to claim, like, say, Jude 3 teaches Sola Scriptura, because, like, the Aris, you know, the fate that has been delivered, that would mean that Jude is not part of the fate that's been delivered, and it's not God breed. It's only like a historical document documenting something, you know, and the same with any of the other passages. <laughs> but uh, that's that's something. So, uh, any, anyone want to comment on this before we kind of uh, start moving along? Um, at yeah. space? Well, if there's any portion you guys want to stop, just let me know as well. But yeah. I'll holler at you. On. So, I'm doing this video so I can kind of. Just get it all out there. Uh, oh, and by the way, I just noticed this. Like, there's a book in the background. If you can look at it, uh, just behind him, it's yellow with brown and blue. Uh -huh. That's a book arguing for the spalding theory of Book of Mormon origins. Uh -huh. No, that could, that should tell you like how little the guy he is. Knows, but, yeah. This guy, he's he's currently authoring some kind of a book, and he actually puts the chapters online. Um, they're connected to these videos, and they're just it's it's. The oldest, most, I mean, worse than the CS letter quality um, anti that he that he draws from, you know. Let's let's go back to the days of you know, E.B. E. Howe and uh, just yeah. Uh, for anyone to watch, and then if you have questions afterwards, you can email me, call me, whatever you would like to to do. Well, I have one question. Uh, can you name one person from one hundred to one thousand one hundred who was a proto present? Oh, I'm sorry, James, you, you, you refused to answer that one. <laughs> and, and what this is, is basically a skeleton uh, outline of why I personally, and then why Christians in general, historically... Okay, did anyone catch that? Christians in general, historically. I was yeah. about to say, um, no, they haven't. Which, is, which again... I mean, early Christians didn't. Yeah, which again, <laughs> makes relevant specifically the que the request that you had. Uh, for those who may not know, I had a brief exchange with Hazleton, and we were meant to discuss Sola Scriptura, but he wanted to change it to a great apostasy and restoration. And I said I would, but whenever people, and, you know, for those who interact with, like, say, Protestants, like, either as a missionary or, like, um, elsewhere, you'll probably come across it. They assume Protestantism to be true. They don't prove it, they just assume it to be true, you know. Yeah, it's a presuppositional so my question, So my question is, from the year 100, with the close of the final book in the New Testament, to say the year 1,000, 1,100. I'll give you like 1,000 years. Can you name one person, not even a group, but one person who believed, as part of the gospel, your understanding of justification, your understanding of baptism, i.e. a rejection of baptism or regeneration, and also what's the other... Oh, and in the formal sufficiency of the 66 books of the Bible. I asked Hazleton that a few times. He refused to answer. Um, you're not going to find anyone who supports it. You know, and I'm familiar with William Webster and his proof texts. Uh, there's none. Um, now, some will actually claim Athanasius, uh, for instance, uh, believed in the formal sufficiency of the Bible. Uh, did anyone actually watch the debate between... Yeah, it's the, I was going to say that was quoted in the debate with the uh, yeah. Apologia church guys. Yeah, uh, let me actually read Athanasius. Athanasius did believe in the high view of the scripture, but here's the thing. One of his festal letters, the 39th festal letter, excludes... Esther and explicitly includes the book of Baruch. So he did not actually operate, even if you were to appeal to that festal letter that James White and Bill Webster often appeal mm -hmm. to. He did not actually appeal to their canon. Of course, in context, he's talking about the liturgical canon. But even then, like, uh, it doesn't support it. But here's what he actually said about the Council of Nicaea. And this is from to the, Af to the bishops of Africa 2, or in the PG set, 26.103.2. But the word of the Lord, which came through the ecumenical synod of Nicaea, abides forever. And as I know here, 
Athanasius says that the word, the rhema of the Lord, came to Nicaea, the first council of Nicaea, of course, and it bites forever, mene eis ton eona. Athanasius is borrowing from the language of Isaiah 40, verse 8 in the Septuagint, which reads, the word of our God remains forever. A common proof text, funny enough, for, like, say, the textual preservation of the Bible. No person would ever claim anything about any source of truth or authority other than in scripture aid revelation. Because Protestants will claim, yes, there's creeds are true, confessions are true, insofar as they're uh, faithful to the Bible, but they're not inspired. But according to Athanasius, God actually spoke through the Council of Nicaea, and it's part of the Word of God. You know, and there's other places as well where Athanasius or Augustine or any of the other people they appeal to, even with, like, say, the first five, six hundred years of Christianity, uh, clearly did not believe in Sola Scriptura. You know, you also have Irenaeus, you claim, like, um, unless Christ you can actually trace your origins back to the apostolic tradition and the laying on of hands, you know, a true church against Gnostics, you know, how many Protestants would claim that, except maybe Anglicans. Um, once, once you examine the patristics, yes, they're not proto-Mormon in many important respects, and I don't think any Latter-day Saint who actually studies the patristics will claim, especially the later ones, are proto-Mormon. But here's the thing, they're not proto-Protestant at all, and according to Protestantism, there has not been a great apostasy. And I keep stressing this, Protestants functionally approach church history, like early Christianity, as if there was a great apostasy, while claiming there was not a great apostasy. But they can never actually show any believer, quote-unquote, from their perspective, who held the same gospel as they do about justification, rejecting baptism, regeneration, the nature of the church, ecclesiology, and so forth, like loads of important issues. So, functionally, they approach patristic texts as if there is a great apostasy that did take place, Hazelton included. But of course they can't admit it because that would mean that there was a great apostasy and ma, you know, ma Matthew sixteen eighteen says that it was. <laughs> I, I know I, I know I spoke uh, quite a bit on that, but you know that's something I'm passionate about. But any any comments on the whole um well this is what Christians have historically believed in. <laughs> Maybe since um, the 14th yeah, century. It's yeah. just, well, and I mean, the problem with him is, is that there's no, I, I think that that's why he doesn't get very far and decides to make a video on the point is that um, I, I talk to a lot of, a lot of uh, people with the missionaries and, and, you know, sometimes they're, they're legitimate and they're very uh, genuine in their interest in the, in the Latter-day Saint faith. And other times they're just antagonistic. And when they're antagonistic, usually it, they, they, they try to make these claims predicated on points. And as they make the points, they assume that you're just nodding your head in agreement to the points. But if you're thinking and you're paying attention, they lay out a point and you say, wait a minute, now you have to prove and support the point. You have to demonstrate that point. And they're like, no, no, let me finish. And, and the, the response to that is, I don't want to have you lay out nine or 20 points and then have to go back and, and remember each point in this discussion that we're having. Let's start off with the first point. So in his arguments and discussions that he's had, that's often the problem that he runs into. And he perceives that as rudeness or, or something like that, rather than attempts to try to get him to outline his positions coherently and then support them from the Bible, if that's what he's assuming you have to do. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it would be disingenuous for any one of us, like, in a debate or a dialogue to assume Mormonism is true. Right. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's equally as disingenuous, disingenuous for them to claim, to assume their brand of Protestantism is true without actually supporting it. And here's the thing, like, um, show me where in the Bible, you know, using the historical grammatical method, special revelation would cease with the uh, inscripturation of the final book in the New Testament. There's no passage. And that's an essential, again, this is an essential building block of sola and tota scriptura. You cannot have sola scriptura without tota scriptura. You know, um, yeah. And there's other things as well. And for those, well, then when they throw it, when they scripture. throw it in, yeah, when they throw it in fallibility and inerrancy, that becomes even more problematic because obviously what they're what they're relying on, and, and he actually makes a couple of pleas as we go through the video to to exegetical analysis and hermeneutics, and you know claims to have taken some classes in those in that respect. I'm sure he did. And I so and I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that that Hazelton's you know completely, you know, a, a, a dummy, but. The point is, is that if he's going to do that, he's relying on a scholarship, on a secular scholarship's perspective, 
and it is not favorable to positions that require inerrancy or an inerrancy reading from those texts because those texts have some complex historical and textual problems and and he's aware of them he calls them bible difficulties um but but he he kind of ignores them in the process of trying to keep that analysis alive uh daniel you were about to say something yeah i do want to jump in something real quick just when you're like there and this may not even be most of them maybe even the more i actually have noticed like a lot of the ones who have read more about like biblical history and stuff don't really make this argument but i do think it's worth mentioning that when you say a lot of people are like well there's no passage in there that says you know that this is that books have been complete there is at least a certain segment of protestants that will be like well you know there's that verse at the end of revelation that says you know oh you know that this is the it like you know you can't add or take away from this book and it but says again, the end at the very bottom as well yeah but the thing about that is again this is again this is why i think a lot of the ones who are more a little more under educated don't make this argument as much it's because when you see how the bible's come was compiled you see a revelation like it was compiled all those books were made separately they did not know that the 66 books were going to be put together and even then it wasn't even 66 martin luther took some of those out so the how many books you know there were uh were going to be put together like that they didn't know that and also the other thing you could say is like well deuteronomy says the same thing that's why the sadducees made that same argument he said you can't take it down or any more to from the first five books of moses so again like a lot of these arguments that they make to us the jews make towards you know i guess us too but but towards you know mainstream Christianity as well. So yeah, and also like just speaking of like inerrancy and infallibility, e even if you want to argue that the not just the original autographs, but like if you want to go like crazy here and claim the Bible as we now have it still remains inerrant and infallible, that does not necessarily that does not necessitate sola scriptura, because you can believe in inerrancy of scripture and still reject sola scriptura. I mean, one of the leading defenders of inerrancy of the autographs was actually Robert Bellarmine. And if you know anything about him, like, um, he, he was, like, sainted and canonized, you know, and made a doctor of the Catholic Church because, like, he ragged a lot on the Protestants. <laughs> so, um, like, you even have, like, say, Leo the Tertians, he was, like, one of the most hardcore popes in recent history. Even, even released an encyclical, um, not an encyclical, but, like, a in, near infallible teaching claiming that Anglican orders are, like, null and void and not true priests, you know. Uh, so he wasn't, like, a liberal. It was, like, um, he would also issue an encyclical, um, from the 1890s, um, the name escapes me at the moment, but it's basically affirming the inerrancy of scripture as well. So, again, uh, inerrancy of scripture, and often they think like this is the case, inerrancy of scripture does not sell the scripture or make. And even, it's like the cessation of public revelation does not necessitate sell the scripture. So, uh, the analogy often, often used, like, say, from World War One, where you have, like, the uh, little planes, you have to, like, um, wind up first and then you're floating in the air it's like we have our plane now you could say like it's made from cardboard and it's easily shot down but at least we're in the air flying we're still waiting for the present to actually realize like um his airplane doesn't even have an engine to begin with you know to actually engage in this kind of battle they're focusing on what the raw chains at times but yeah um and something i'd like to add as well is um so I was actually kind of having a debate with this about a certain individual we all know named Paul D. And, uh, you know, he just told me that he actually told me that exact thing is, oh, this has been this is how it's been for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years in Christian hundreds and thousands of years in Christianity. And, you know, this is how it is now. That's how it's always going to be. And I'm like, you know, Christ didn't teach Source, this. Source, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was just pointed out, you know, there is, uh, you know, Christ didn't teach any of this. And he's like, well, but that's how we have to do it now because that's just how it is. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because you claim, you know, you make that same claim about the church is like, oh, you guys aren't scripturally backed. So I'm like, that's literally, yeah, but that's all I got to say about that. Uh, yeah. Um, during the, there was a debate and it's actually on YouTube. It's one of the better debates uh, featuring James White. It's against a Catholic. He's now a set of a contest, uh, Jerry Maddox. Uh, the Great Debate to Solo Scripture in 1997. And during the cross-examination, White basically just omits the point. Um, Matic is asked, did the people in Jesus' day practice Solo Scriptura, the hearers of our Lord? And according to Paul Gee, I'm guessing he would say yes. Uh, White says, I have said over and over again that Solo Scriptura is a doctrine that speaks to the normative condition of the Church, not to times of inscripturation. So when asked, uh, so your answer is no, White, who is a leading defender of Solo Scriptura, he's written a book on it, Scripture alone, so forth. That is exactly what my answer is. It is no. If asked if the apostles practice it, White just said no, adding it's Solo Scriptura, speaks of times 
after the inscripturation of Scripture. So when asked, you admit that Jesus in practice sola scriptura, as well as he hears of our Lord and the apostles, White said, he asserted it. So at least White, he's honest, you know, as he's David Keane and Bill Webster and Eric Svensson and a number of others. Sola scriptura was not something that was taught even during the uh, Revelation period. You know, uh, no one taught sola scriptura. It's an extra biblical tradition here, uh, which of course, I, and he doesn't realize this, it means no passage of scripture can actually teach using the historical grammatical method sola scriptura. In fact, of all the interpretations out there that's possible, that's the one that's impossible from the get-go. So, uh, so much for the formal of the of Bible. So, Of course, the risk to that is always, okay, only in times of special inscripturation. When are those? Yeah. And how, how do you know you're in one or you're not? Right? Because you're currently rejecting additional it, 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 mean, it means you can't be dogmatic about this part. It's, it's a self-defeating. Yeah. Like, it's literally just... And then, well, so what it does, it makes my brain hurt. And so you sit there dumbfounded, staring, going, uh... Yeah, okay, let's, let's kind of uh, go on here. ...have rejected uh, LDS um, claims of new and additional scripture. In... By the way, I know this is obvious, but I'll just say here, Mormonism can be false. That does not mean Protestantism is true. So here's the thing. LDS could be wrong about modern revelation. That does not mean the Bible is formally sufficient or that Protestantism, however you want to define it, is true. So who wants to take a bet like he's just going to assume Protestantism all throughout? Well, I think in his defense, his, um, I mean, there's only, so if you're going to do something, you can only focus on like kind of one argument at a time if you want to be efficient. I mean, you can try to juggle around like three or four things. So like, and I'm not saying, obviously, I mean, I'm not saying that I agree with the thing, but at least in his defense, um, if you're going to focus on, you know, Elias Scripture, like Sola Scriptura, like, it, I mean, like, you can only really juggle so much at a time if you want to make decent arguments. Yeah, sure. I'm just, I'm not really talking about this video per se, but like, I'm talking about more like, um, yes, the take many would take, like, well, you know, you just assume Protestant doesn't be true. Um, but yeah, the point, your point's taken. But I think it should be said, though, like, um, just because Mormonism may be false does not mean Protestantism is the default position. Um, so even the, even if he doesn't want to like focus on that here, eventually that's something that he would have to raise himself uh, and discuss and prove to others as well that his favorite Protestantism TM is true as well and consistent with what he believes to be the uh, sources of truth. And something tells me he doesn't believe in baptismal regeneration, so that would result in a lot of gymnastics. But yeah. In addition to the 66 books of the Bible, um, if you have again, if you have questions, feel free to email me. And I've, I have three categories. There are three main points that I want to go through. And the first reason, uh, Travis, you're right. He's not a Calvinist. Two, he has three points, not five. Reason uh, why I personally don't accept uh, the additional books like the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, uh, and what have you is I'm suspicious, number one, number one, I'm suspicious of the motivation for requiring an open canon. Uh, okay, so his first point is like he's suspicious for anyone who would require an open canon. But here's the thing, how can he be consistent? Maybe he, we'll see throughout the video he is. How can he be consistent in claiming it's a problem or like it's questionable if you believe in an open canon in the modern era when, of course, uh, and I'm sure he'll be quoting from the Old Testament, he'll be quoting from the New, New Testament, all those prophets and apostles and oracles were living at a time of an open canon, not a closed canon. Because if they were living in an open, uh, closed canon, none of the books they were uh, producing was indeed scripture. They're just like useful historical sources like First Clement or the authentic letters of Ignatius. So well, and that's 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 one of my issues with it is that the and and when I talk to a lot of uh, Christians, especially Protestants and evangelicals, the, the issue that I have with them is they're, they're trying to use evidence-based arguments, um, historical arguments, scholarly type arguments in, in supporting a lot of these positions. And, and it does, it sounds intellectual when they do that, but the problem with it is, is just as he says, I'm suspicious of anybody who believes in an open canon. Well, Jesus of Nazareth believed in an open canon because or or he didn't let's say that he let's say that he didn't well then you've got the gospels are literally the limitation 
to what should be appended to any type of scripture because the life and times and interpretations of the closed canon. So effectively, I had somebody quote uh, Luke 24, where Christ goes through and says the law of Moses and the, the Psalms and the prophets, and it kind of saying, oh, that's, that's Jesus identifying the Hebrew scriptures as the canon. And I said, fine, you know, that's, that's a good argument. Luke 24, that's, you know, that's one of the last chapter of the gospel. And you've got, you know, him identifying the, the, the canon of the Hebrew canon. And so really the canon should end with Luke. And, and Jesus is closing the canon officially. And I, I said that would be at least logically coherent if, if indeed that's what's happening. He's interpreting the Hebrew text. He's closing the canon. Good job. But the problem with that is, is that now you have the, the pesky little problem of using history and scholarship. Who wrote Luke and when was it written? And when did the source material come about? And did Jesus even say all of the things that are recorded in Luke? And of course, then it becomes the, the presupposition that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God, and those kinds of claims, which are holy spiritual claims. Those aren't scholars. Those are outside of the reach of history and scholarship. But you're, yet they're, they're inconsistently trying to use two different epistemologies that become somewhat inconsistent when you try to force them together. And so it, it becomes a a hybridization that that requires the person with whom they're interacting to kind of go along and hold hands and say, "Okay, I'm going to concede that Jesus of Nazareth is in fact who he who later Christians claimed he was." Fine, but I'm going to make sure that I'm only using scholastic type arguments when analyzing the texts. So you're presupposing religious and theological claims but then you're only going to rely on text-based historical critical evidence. And, and, and those two claims become disparate in that respect, because if that's what you're claiming, Jesus is simply a first century rabbi who is closing the canon. And, and that's, what, that's what those arguments become. And it just becomes nonsensical and absurd. Yeah, and it kind of shows like uh, functionally they have to argue against the idea like um... – Jesus was living during a time of special revelation that the 27 books of the Bible are additions to the pre-existing quote-unquote canon uh, as Lucy defined as Lucy defined as it was in the first century as we know from like manuscript discoveries e even that text in Luke 24 44 says the law, the prophets and then the writings, you know um, and like loads of scholars even Protestants like Lee Murray McDonald will argue the Jews of the first century um, had a good understanding, like some of the limits of the canon, like you have the five books of Moses and you have the prophets, but then they were unsure of like a bunch of other books as well. So like the Ryans, you know, it was like law, uh, because like you know, as noted, like you had the Sadducees and then you had the Pharisees and then you had the Essenes, who were a bit crazy, but you also had the Samaritans as well, you know, and um, they they would agree, like say when it comes to say some of the core aspects of the again, quote-unquote, canon. But then they were divided by, like, some of the outer limits at times. You know, even excluding the crazy Sadducees or the Samaritans. You know, you had uh, uh, you know, the Pharisees, you know, who... Some Pharisees actually seemed to believe that Baruch... Not Baruch. Uh, yeah, Baruch, Tobit, and Sirach were inspired in some way. Others did not. You know, and it wasn't until, like, say, the Baruch Hukba revolt that um, you had, like, some type of finalization of it. Again... Um, Gary Mishuta, uh, who's a Catholic apologist, has been doing a lot of very good work on this. So, like, for those who want to delve more into this, um, he's a Apocrypha Apocalypse channel, as well as his books, Why Catholic Bibles Are Bigger in the Case with Deuter Canon. Um, actually pretty jive very well with what we have in Section 91 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So, um, well, and, uh, and, 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 and I think along with that, one of the things that's kind of an important practice point with respect to, to utilizing that information from the perspective of teaching is the idea that... It, they often present Judaism and Jews in the first century as a monolith who all accepted, well, Jews accepted the Hebrew Bible. And, and, and that's not, that's not correct. There wasn't a, a consistently accepted across all of the sects of Judaism because 
you know, as you just identified, Robert, Judaism was was divided into sects. And yeah, anybody I, who's read the Char- New Testament Charles, Gospel Charles should Worf, know that. Uh, James Charles Worf, who's in the Old Testament Seed of Africa, he was right. There's not Judaism. There's Judaisms as well as not a Messiah, mm-hmm. but Messiahs. There's like... And there's not Christianity. There's Christianities. Exactly. You know. Okay, that's kind of uh, try to move on. Um, hopefully we can get like a few minutes of this uh, as part one and then... Um, I'm a fan of true crime podcasts. I'm a mailman. I listen to podcasts. I love true crime uh, podcasts. And investigators are always asking after the crime, and they're trying to find out who did it. They're always asking for what is the motivation for the event. And when a Latter Day Saint asks me or says, "Why do you believe the canon is closed?" and obviously they believe the canon is open. So my question is, what is the motivation for an open canon? Why- Again, the same motivation that the New Testament authors had. Um, where, where's the motivation for a closed canon? You know, uh, Bible, verse, chapter, justification. Um, and keep in mind, like, the Solus Scripture is like, it's a, not a minor issue. This is the formal doctrine of Protestantism. So, you know, don't get me wrong, like, the question he's asking is important for, like, a Latter-day Saint to address, but, like, um... It's also important for like us when discussing with Protestants to realize they're they're not the default position. They have a burden to bear as well, and this is not a minor issue. This is the formal doctrine of Protestantism. You know, uh, Daniel, you're about to say something. I think. Yeah, I was about to say like I just because here's the thing like the truth is is like in a way what he's saying is like if you like change it up like I almost kind of like agree with what he's saying. He's like oh like you need to add in like extra stuff so like you understand different doctrines, like, beyond just the Bible. I'm like, well, yeah. Like, I mean, because it's also, if you want to just do like that, it's just like, well, yeah, these other things help us understand the Bible more, too. But, like, it, he makes it sound like it's so nefarious. Like, it's like, we're so, we're trying to, like, like, oh, you're trying to add in new things. What's your motivation? Huh? Like, it's like, well, like, it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, yeah, our motivation is to, it is to understand, like, the gospel and, like, Again, like like what I said earlier, like it's to add into the light and truth. It's sort of like, well, why, you know, if you want to do their version, you know, why, you know, have the book of like John if you've got those first other three books, you know, why, why are you trying to add it? To, but yeah, the book of John adds a lot of insight. It adds in a lot of insight that you wouldn't have if you just had the three synoptics. Exactly. Like, I mean, it's fine. But like, it's like, oh, why are you trying to add in the book of John? Are you trying to like find something, you know, add in something else? Like, yeah, that. Is that so terrible? Like, he's making... I don't know. That's how... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's like, you know, we meet in our weekly cabal. It's like, you know, what else can we add to this open canon, you know? You know, protocols of the uh, elders of Mormon Zion, you know? Um, but, like, no, what you bring about, about, like, the Gospel of John, it's like, um, you, you could go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke until you're blue in the face. You're not going to find any... Maybe implicit, but you're not going to find any explicit text that teaches the personal pre-existence of Jesus in the in those three Gospels. John is explicit about the personal pre-existence of Jesus. You know, that's a Christological dogma for many. Rightfully so as well. But, you know, so already you have, like, say, personal pre-existence marked off, you know. Um, um, but, yeah. Um, again, like, it's for clarification. It's to address modern issues. It's also, you know, doctrinal um, development and so forth. You know, it's you know, basically like what the New Testament uh, provides us as a model, you know. Um and again, I will note one of the building blocks and one of the assumptions here is special revelation ceased at some point when, and also provide the biblical texts. And I'll be interested to see if he actually realizes or addresses this. As I said, I'm watching this like uh, blind, so uh, yeah. I want to add just one so my, thing. My, oh, sorry, you, you go. Never mind. No, one, one, of my, one of my issues is, is just some of his uses of analogies, and, and we've got to be careful, and, and I'm not trying to be hyper hyper technical about the use of analogy, which is what he's trying to do. The problem with it is, is that taking analogy and, and actually applying it correctly, um, you know, when there's a crime that occurs, investigators aren't concerned primarily with motive. They're, preserved, they're concerned with gathering evidence. And that's, that's what he's doing is he's saying, we're assuming closed canon and we're questioning motive. No, it's where's the evidence for closed canon, not where's the motivation for opening a canon. That's, that's a completely nonsensical, even, even the analogy that he's using. So that's what I'm saying. The whole breakdown of some of his arguments is so fundamentally flawed um, at every stage 
that, it, that I, I really struggled when I was sitting there patiently trying to listen to him do this presentation when he when I he and I were, were zooming together. It was it was really I, I did kind of you know where you kind of pinch yourself <laughs> underneath the table to to continue to listen through it. But the idea that he's he's believing that a true crime broadcast is going to be motive based and that that's how they solve crimes. No, they solve crime based on evidence. The the way that they that they determine potential um, <clears throat> suspects in a crime i mean usually cops are relatively straightforward they you know if, if somebody dies the first people you look at is their relatives somebody may have killed them and who had a motivation with respect to the the killing of the person with in in the proximity but motives don't matter what matters is the evidence because obviously somebody could have a great motive for murdering somebody for example but there's no evidence that supports that they did and so that's that's my issue is he's trying to say we open the cannon. What's our motivation? No, no. The cannon is open. What's the evidence that it's closed? And he's not looking at it as an evidence base. He's looking at a motive base. I, I just don't think that's a, a proper analysis. You were about to say something, uh, Daniel? Yeah, I think, again, this is another quote from um, Rough Stone Rolling. And I think actually this really illustrates a big mindset difference between us and the Protestants. Um, is that, again, he's talking about Joseph Smith and, like, his views of the Bible and why, you know, all these other mainstream Christians like, oh, my gosh, what is this guy talking about? What a blasphemy. Again, anyways, he says right here, it says, um, for Joseph, but for Joseph, the Bible was a gate, not a fence. Joseph's daring, his blasphemous audacity, his enemies would say, erected a barrier to collaboration. Monstrous claims, John Quincy called them in 1844. What, what point was there to looking for common ground when Joseph had departed from other realms entirely? He created a transbiblical world unlike anything known to in the Christian churches and had no interest in forming alliances with less venturous souls. So, yeah, that's the big thing. It's like they're like, this is, they, I love that part where it says, like, for Joseph, the Bible is a gate, not a fence. And so he's saying, why are you putting a fence in the gate? Huh? Like, why are you doing that? Because the idea is that, like, the gate opens you to more knowledge and understanding. They're like, and that's what the whole Bible was doing. That's why, again, why they think that argument's like, it's your job to prove that the big canon is closed because according to the Bible, the canon was already open. That there's a lot of knowledge that like Abraham did not have that they got in by, the, by revelation. There's a lot. And the, um, and saying like, oh, it just sort of stops. The, like, again, like you gotta, you have to prove that the gate is closed, but we're just saying, no, it's not closed. It keeps going. Yeah. Good point. And again, it, go, it, it goes back to what I was saying. There's no text in its context mm -hmm. that teaches a closed or the uh, cessation of public revelation. And again, that's an essential building block for Solus Scripture to be true. You know, um, but yeah, no, that's a great quote. And everyone should read uh, Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling. <laughs> um, oh and I'd like yeah. to add just something real quick. Um, so the way he's like talks about it it sounds like he's trying to make it sound like there's a sinister motive behind um having an open canon like the church is trying to control the masses or brainwash us or something and um you know that's just not, not true because you know he brought up like the book of mormon the doctrine and covenants and the pearl of great price there's nothing controlling in any of those books nothing at all nothing that limits me nothing that tells me i mean there are some things in the doctrine and covenants just some co some laws and ordinances that we need to follow but nothing that's like sinister like just off the wall crazy to the point that it's just super controlling yeah but uh, yeah but like listen to this like he it's clear like he wants to engage in like what's called boundary maintenance it seems like this is more like for like say Protestants you want to engage with Latter Day Saints as opposed to Latter Day Saints, um, because like this is easy, this is really poor stuff. But um, it's more like well, you know, the add to uh, scripture and stuff like that. You know, and, you know, in their weekly cabals to like undermine the truth. You know, um, but yeah, just the sixty six uh, books of the Bible that Christians have accepted as the infallible source for uh, nearly two thousand years. That's a lie. Uh, you're not going to find any single person who believed only the 66 books of the Bible were the sole infallible source of authority for 2,000 years. E even like uh, you have uh, early Christians who would often use Tobit, for instance, to support their doctrinal justification. You would have others as well who would use other sources, like uh, Ignatius, 
or Irenaeus and others who would often appeal to say ecclesiology to uh, settle disputes as well. So, you know, you know, the idea, like, the 66 books, again, the canon issue, uh, being the sole source, uh, sole formally sufficient, infallible source, it's anachronistic. And again, like, um, anyone who believed it in the first, like, say, say, 13, 1400 years, you had, like, say, some hints of it before Luther, to be sure. Because Protestantism is basically a corruption of a medieval concept and heresy that was growing in the 13th and 14th century. But you're not going to find anyone who believed um, what you find in, say, the Reformed Confessions or other works um, prior to, say, the first millennium. And that's a huge amount of time. So any any comments on that? Or, um... Um, and no comment on that specifically, but, like, this little hypothetical scenario that he's got set up almost makes it, you know, seem like he'd rather deflect than answer a direct question, you know, and I, I don't know if that speaks to the strength of his position, whether he realizes that or not, or if it's just more discomfort with the Bible difficulties or, you know, whatever other reason he wants to give. But it, it just seems interesting to me, you know, where rather than go out and say, oh, this is what I've, what I've got to offer, you know, accept or reject it however you like he goes well this is what's wrong with your position here or your your thought your idea your belief uh let me just actually uh, support what i said earlier um polycarp uh, who's year 69 to 155 so a very early christian author wrote a book um the epistle to the philippians in chapter 10 we actually read the following and this is from volume 1 page 35 of the first volume of the Antonician father series stand fast therefore in these things and follow the example of the lord being firm and unchangeable in the faith loving the brotherhood and being attached to one another joined together in the truth exhibiting the meekness of the lord in your intercourse with one another and despising no one when you can do good defer it not because quote alms delivers from death unquote but be all of you subject one to another, having your conduct blameless among the Gentiles, that ye both receive praise of your good works, and the Lord may not be blasphemed through you. But woe by, to him by whom the name of the Lord is blasphemed, teach therefore sobriety to all, and manifest it, unto, uh, manifest it also in your own conduct. And as I note, uh, this is from my book on baptism, but uh, the note following the quotation in bold, which I put in quote, uh, is Tobit 4.10 and Tobit 12.9. And this is a Protestant work. Shaf is a Protestant. Uh, let's quote, um, and they read, For almsgiving delivers from the debt and keeps you from uh, going into the darkness. Tobit 4.10 and 12.9. For almsgiving saves from debt and purges away sin. Those who give alms will enjoy a full life. So here, Polycarp late 1st, early 2nd uh, century Christian author references as scripture the book of Tobit and uses it to support a theology that's actually antithetical to Protestant theology. How many Protestants believe that almsgiving is the an instrumental source of the remission of sins and justification? So, uh, no, you're not... If you were to look carefully at, say, even just the Apostolic Fathers, like Ignatius, one Clement, and also, like, if you want to throw in Justin Murphy as well, I'm not claiming that they were proto-Mormon in all respects. They weren't. They were patristics, but they were clearly not proto-Protestant. And the idea that this is the historic belief for 2,000 years, it's its nonsense. It's I'm, I'm not claiming it's a lie because I already doubt James Hazelton has actually read any of the patristics. For him, church history probably begins with Billy Graham, but it's false. It's, it's, it's seriously false. It's like if I were to claim belief in Joseph Smith as a prophet of God can be traced from the third century onwards. It's it's anachronistic and it's just plain stupid. <laughs> so what is the motivation? Uh, Latter Day Saints are not the only group that believe in an open canon, and I, I found I found some uh, commonalities between these groups that want a, an open canon. I believe he actually claims Catholics believe in an open canon, but let's let let's see if he actually makes this claim. Uh, groups like. The Latter-day Saints, obviously, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are another big one, uh, and the Roman Catholic Church. That's a lie. Roman Catholicism does not teach an open canon. Catholicism as a dogma teaches a closed canon with the death of the last apostle. Um, I have no idea where he's getting this idea. 
No, it's and Jehovah's true. Witnesses I, don't believe in Nelson Kennedy either. Same, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing they do as well. They would hold the Sola Scriptura, but I'm more familiar with yeah. Catholicism. Catholicism does not teach a open canon. They believe the canon was closed. And also, um, they believe that the deposit of phage, both the oral tradition and the written tradition, ended with the death of the last apostle. And that's not just my uh, claim as being a former Catholic who studied in the Catholic seminary. That's the teaching of the Council of Trent, and that's the dogmatic teaching of the First Vatican Council. You know, where it explicitly states that the Holy Spirit was not promised to the Church or the successors of Peter, that by their new revelation they may disclose new doctrine, but instead that, you know, um, that they preserve the deposit of faith, which was uh, delivered once for all uh, by either Jesus or the first generation of apostles. That's a paraphrase about the Council of Trent in Vatican I. Rome does not teach a open canon. It's the I think there's a, de a decent chance he's like, Assuming everyone who doesn't believe in social security believes in some sort of open canon. Like, again, again, I don't know this, that may be off, but I think that's a pretty decent bet. He's like, if you don't believe in social security there's so if you don't know that means like if it's open to something other than script, other than the Bible. I guess that's maybe his definition of open canon. If you're open to some other um, significant um, spiritual source other than just the Bible, I think that might be, and, and what I mean is like some something on the level of the Bible, not just like your pastor. Sure. No. And if that's how he's defining that one, how he's defining it is very sloppy, and two, for Rome at least, that's true. You know, they would believe, like, you know, the magisterium, when certain criteria are met, are on the same authority of level as scripture and so forth. But the claim that Catholics believe in an open canon is sloppy at best and disingenuous at worst. But maybe, maybe being generous to him, and when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses as well, Maybe what he means is that they're inconsistent with it, and functionally they treat it as an open canon, you know, or something to that effect. I don't know, but like the claim that it, it's it's still like a very sloppy claim. Um, so, <coughs> but at least it, it, it's nice to know like he's ignorant not just about Mormonism, but he's ignorant about loads of other things as well. So he's at least he's consistent on that score, right? <laughs> But um, yeah. So, church. There's lots of others, but those are kind of the three uh, biggies. What are some commonalities that I see with these three groups for guilt by association, a lo common logical fallacy, <laughs> Re requiring or wanting an open canon of scripture? Uh, number one, the canon must be open to inter to introduce their unique doctrines. Doctrines. Um. Okay. <laughs> that are unique to their particular group. There are some very specific doctrines of the LDS Church uh, that are simply not found in Christian history or in the Bible or in, in anywhere else other than within the, the LDS Church. So, the A couple of things. First of all, the very same thing can be said about Protestantism, like the rejection of baptismal regeneration. It's explicit in the Bible. It's explicit in Christian history. It's not until, like, Zwingli well, you actually come across that. But, yeah, uh, go ahead, Travis. Well, he just he just made it. Uh, he, I mean, that's the problem with it is, is is that even the presentation, he's 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 reading it off of a written document because honestly, I'll 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 provide the link for the discussion that that I had with him. He's giving the exact same verbatim uh, speech, so this is something that he thought about, put together, and assembled, and yet he just said they're not found in the Bible or in Christian history. And what was the other source that he, he mentioned? There was another source that he mentioned, but he says that or, or, there's other sources for developing doctrines. I, that's that's self-refuting of sola scriptura. So we don't find these doctrines in the Bible or in Christian history. So he he's really imprecise and uncareful with what he's actually saying. And again, that comes from not actually laying out definitions of terms. What is sola scriptura and defining it for your audience? So they can understand what exactly it is that's required to prove it. S accusing Jehovah's Witnesses of an of an open canon is laughably ignorant. They they adhere absolutely to the biblical texts that they have their New World Translation. The New World Translation goes through and omits some of the more questionable passages, um, saying that they're not original to the Greek. Their whole purpose is to get back to what they believe is the original texts as they would have appeared on the autographs of course that's you know impossible to do but that's that's their goal so they they believe in it so readily and so much that 
they're trying to get back to the original manuscripts and the documents. So they have a very high view of scripture and, and to accuse them of an open canon simply because they agree with doctrines that you don't think are in the Bible, but sitting down with somebody of another faith, which means I, I, don't, I wonder how much interaction he actually has from an honest perspective with either Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Catholics. I mean, he lives in St. George, so probably not too much. But I really doubt he actually cares what history has to say anyway. Um, my interactions with him, he doesn't know much about ecclesiastical history to begin with. I doubt he's actually read any of the apostolic fathers. But I'm sure, like, if there was, like, say, a belief that was historical, you know, attested from day one, that goes against what he's understanding of the gospel, like baptismal regeneration or a true believer can lose their justification, he would say, it doesn't matter, history, you know, that's all man-made. You know, my interpretation of the biblical revelation says otherwise and like it begs the question like how do we adjudicate between debates between even those within his own internal community like protestantism as a whole again like you have a very lousy job like you have the last 500 years where you can't adjudicate objectively when it comes to say central issues about salvation like baptism regeneration or the nature of justification or kind of believe or lose their salvation and kind of relates to another thing like Many of the doctrines he thinks are unique to Mormonism or requires an open canon. Yeah, maybe explicitly, but like I can defend until the cows come home. Like some of the doctrines I'm sure he thinks are part of that, like say divine embodiment or creation ex materia as opposed to ex nihilo. You know, and again, um, for him, who's going to provide the objective uh, adjudication here and say what you will about like some of the limits we may have you know which was noted earlier at least we do have some objective source external to scripture as a present he only has subjectivity yeah i think that again like kind of going you said like i think it's a sort of evidence that a lot of the protestants i think i i think um, again if you want to be really terrible i think a lot of them really do think that like their interpretation is objectively in the bible but it just shows how like difficult it is for them to just grasp because even if you look like for example again like we said look, for example like the, the trinity they're like the bible it is so clearly taught in the bible that the trinity is it but it's really not like i could even like let's take out all unique lds scripture anything unique lds or mormon or anything it would be so easy to read the bible or like the stuff in there just saying like oh like you know it's it's you know symbolic that like you know they're not literally it's like it's kind of it's almost makes and at least and again this is my perspective as a latter-day saint it makes less sense for them to be like for it to be like some kind of like they're three in one and they're the same person but they're not and all that stuff instead of being it's symbolic like oh they're like united in purpose and jesus when he was like i am the door does that mean he's a door like literally or i am the vine you know no when he says i am the father just that's kind of the similar concept like saying oh the father would just be saying what i'm saying right now and you don't even need the Book of Mormon. Well, a lot of them will say the Book of Mormon teaches that too, for that matter. But like, you don't even need like the Doctrine and Covenants or the modern, Joseph Smith and his later teachings to teach it that. You can just read the Bible and see that easy. But they're just like their minds. Like, how can you get that out of the Bible? It just kind of proves to me how diff either how unwilling or how difficult it is for them to like see any other valid interpretation outside of Protestantism. And even Wayne Protestantism, you have that kind of as well. Like you have like one camp like, say, the Lutherans and the Anglicans who believe in baptism of regeneration and the instrument of regeneration is water baptism. And then you have others saying, like, no, that's actually a heresy. You know, that's that's adding to self, that's adding to the atonement, you know, and baptism of regeneration is a heresy, and like, basically a lot of Reformed Baptists and others. But, you know, uh, we're not, and as I said, like, I, I harp on that because, like, that's not a minor issue. This is a matter of salvation, if you were to think about it. And yet, this is something that can't be objectively adjudicated and settled within Protestantism for going on 500 years now. And the same when it comes to the nature of the Eucharist, justificate uh, some aspects of justification and so forth. So, and of course, like bringing up the issues of the Trinity and the relationship between the Father and the Son, uh, that's central to the Gospel as well. Like we're talking about the very identity of God, the very identity and fun um, nature of Christ, which affects the atonement and affects salvation as well, and anthropology and so forth. So. Um, you know, as my friend Blake Oster would say, you know, it's one, it's one mill of a hess. <laughs> the canon must be open to introduce those uh, things. The Roman Catholic Church does the same thing, has very unique Roman Catholic doctrines that are not in the Bible. Uh, and so the canon has to be open in order. Catholics would claim that something that's not explicit in the Bible is going to be there, one, implicitly, and two, explicitly stated in the oral deposit of faith.
So one of the two sources from the apostolic era will be explicit about a certain doctrine. Uh, to give an example from this, and I don't want to seem like I'm being an apologist for Roman Catholicism, but, you know, intellectual honesty, the Assumption of Mary. They would claim that the Assumption of Mary is implicit in the Bible, like true topology, like the uh, Mary being the Ark of the Covenant, and other aspects of that, and woman in uh, Revelation chapter 12, but it's more explicit in what would be the oral tradition, and you see that through like the liturgies and so forth, and its development, until like 1950 when it was elevated to the position of a de fide dogma. So, but again, Rome does not claim there's an open canon. Uh, for them, special revelation and the uh, deposit of faith, which is binding, ceased with the death of the last apostle. And again, this is dogma in Roman Catholicism. So, which kind of indicates being charitable. He has not actually studied Roman Catholic sources like Vatican I and the Council of Trent. And these are sources you must study if you're serious about studying Catholicism. It's like it's it's like claiming you're serious about studying Mormonism and you've never read the Doctrine and Covenants. It's that bad. So He probably hasn't done it. that either. Oh yeah, I doubt that as well. Introduce those uh, unique teachings. Uh, a third commonality with groups that want an open canon is they pro profess belief in the Bible while having guns pointed at it. What do I what do I mean by that? Before we're gonna go into like his church points, like again, has anyone noticed like say the guilt by association here? You know, like the Catholics the Catholics and the JWs believe X, Y, and Z. LDS purportedly believe in X, Y, and Z. You know, it's kind of guilt by association here, but like we, we could play this game with him as well. It's like Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the closed canon and they believe in the formal sufficiency of the Bible. James Hazelton believes in the closed canon and the formal sufficiency of the Bible. Ooh. James Hazelton is a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> yeah, I also think it just kind of goes along with this concept that, like, again, again, this is also something that I actually really like about the LDS churches. Like, oh, like there's truth in like. Other churches, like, I mean, we have the fullness, but there's other things. So you could be like, oh, yeah, like, other churches pretty us. We'd be like, yeah, okay. Like, but for, I think for him, he'd be like, what? Like, these anything other than, like, Protestant? Because, like, when the Protestants say they really just, like, maybe Catholic don't include in that. But really, like, just, like, Protestantism, everything else is, like, a heresy. Maybe Catholicism, but that's questionable. But, like, so if you associate Protestant with anything else, or at least an evangelical Protestant, they'll be like, What? Like, it'll just be, like, great, and they'll just, like, be so offended. But, like, if we're off the city, just be like, okay, yeah. So they, they agree with us. I don't know. Maybe and, maybe I'm being taking a straw man, but that's kind of what I'm getting from you. And Nate in the chat has actually brought up a good point. Uh, guilt by association, same thing they do in seeing that we are the same as Muslims, because you often find, like, guilt by association between, say, Joseph Smith and Muhammad or Latter-day Saints and Islam, especially in the 19th century. You know, uh, Mormonism was seen as the Islam of America. Um you know, because of the belief in extra-biblical prophets and uh, revelation. Um, so, it's, again, it's old hap. Like, again, it's a logical fallacy. It's guilt by association. We could turn on them as well. Like, um, you know, Christadelphians believe in solo scripture, and Christadelphians believe in the complete cessation of special, and in some cases, private revelation at the death of the last apostle. James Hazelton believes the same thing. So, James Hazelton must be a Socinian. He doesn't believe in the real devil and soul death and a host of other things that Christadelphians believe in. It's, it's, it's silly, you know, but it's guilt by association or like, well, Christadelphians are wrong or Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. So, I'm not going to say it explicitly, but I'm just going to apply he's on the same uh, epistemological level or the same true claim or lack thereof level of these aberrant groups, you know. And yeah, you know, we, we do have similarities with when it comes to Roman Catholicism, but one of the similarities, of course, is not an open canon, you know. Um, yeah, Roman Catholicism does believe in apparitions and so forth, you know, especially Mary, but they're not actually binding, even if they're accepted by the church. Like, take Fatima from 1917, the most well-known Marian apparition. Um, that's, you, you can't, because it's an official apparition, you can't claim it's satanic or it's false, but even then, you don't have to believe it. And even then, an apparition does not actually define doctrine. Um, so, yeah. And, um, Travis, you wrote, the guilt by association argument is a terrible position because it in index the Protestants when they are actually informed respecting the beliefs of Catholics, JWs, Adventists, etc., and how much they are in uh, have in common, as I stated. So, yeah. Again, it's a logical fallacy, and I kind of wish fallacies were taught more in school here in Ireland and maybe in the States as well, but, you know, um, but, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's, again, it's guilt by association, so it'll be interesting to see, one, how badly he misrepresents non-LDS fates here, and two, how much he actually engages in fallacious reasoning against us here as well. 
Well, yeah, and it's um, um it's kind of like how like this guilt by association. It's kind of like how some people will lump us in with like the terrible things that the FLDS has done, and be like, oh, it, you know, the FLDS does this, so you know, all Mormons are like this, or just something like that. My mother's like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm but it's sorry. It, it's yeah, it, it's common, but it's a common logical fallacy. But church, they'll say, oh, we believe the Bible, and then. There's the big word, but. We believe in the Bible, but. We believe in the Bible, but we don't believe in this man-made false tradition that Protestantism latches onto it. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, and here's the thing. like We believe the Bible is scripture, but we don't worship it as an infallible being. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Like, I will say this. Um, I've come across some LDS who have a very piss-poor low view of the Bible. You know, there's even one group I belong to where one of the missionaries have actually said he hates the Bible. And that really irks me. But overall, like, uh, Latter-day Saints actually have a more better approach to the Bible and a better respect for the Bible. Because our approach to the Bible is that it's not formally sufficient. And that's the same view of the Apostle Paul. That's the same view of Jesus. And also say this, like, Latter-day Saint theology, unlike, say, Protestantism, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, is either consistent with or is taught by the Bible or is neutral towards it. There's no... Uh, exegetical called conflict, if you will, uh, between uh, Latter-day Saint theology and um, the biblical text when exegeted properly. You know, like in my blog, for instance, if you want to dispute that. But it's true. It, but again, like it's kind of like it's very nefarious. It's like, well, we believe in the Bible, but and the you know, it's very sinister. It's like, but you know, kind of like a, you know, uh, crossing your fingers. No, in reality, it's like we believe in the Bible, but we don't believe in your understanding of its supreme authority. We don't believe in any of the concepts Protestantism imputes, pun intended, into it, because the Bible doesn't actually teach it. We have a more biblical view of the Bible than Protestantism does with its anti-biblical view of the Bible. And I know, like, Protestants will claim, well, we prop it up much higher than you. It's like, maybe so, but you can prop someone or something up so much so that it actually becomes false and even blasphemous. Like, a parallel would be the Roman Catholic, um, exaltation of Mary. You're propping up someone, but you're propping her up beyond how she should be propped up. And by analogy, you're propping up the Bible and impugning it to an authority that Christ never gave to it, none of the apostles gave to it, and it doesn't actually claim for itself as well. Well, I think something else that um, is actually pretty um, important to note is that he's like, he basically, he's like, well, I, I've read the transcripts, I know what he's about to say, he's like, but as far as it's translated correctly, it's like, oh, but like, like, like the idea that we think that there's like translation issues in the Bible, that's a big, bad thing. But like, that is not a unique Mormon thing or LDS thing. Like pretty much and the only people who have like real difficulty with the concept that there could be some major translation issues are evangelical Protestants who have the King James Bible or maybe whatever English translation, but King James Bible is very common. Yeah, you, should, you know, that's the thing. Like, King James Onius, that's it. Yeah. And like, that's the thing. Like, well, I mean, it could be not just King James, but like a lot, of, just at least some English version. But like this is or whatever language they speak, you know, they could be Spanish evangelicals or whatever. Like this is the thing. Like there can be no errors, translations at all. But that's the idea that there could be where well, you acknowledge, oh, there can be some significant translation issues. That's not a unique Mormon thing. And the idea is like, oh, well, we believe the Bible as long as it's trans. Yeah, like I mean, you that should be a given. Like we believe it as long as you've translated it right. Yeah, that that, that why is that so mind blowing? Like I don't know. Like it's just yeah. Well, and, and and I think I think that as Latter Day Saints, we need to be. Um, I, I think we need to change a little bit to, to some degree our approach. I mean, obviously, translation, taking the text from Greek and Hebrew into whatever language it is that you read, it needs to be done, you know, as correctly as possible. Probably with somebody second guessing. I mean, a first person translator usually is going to be more prone to error than when groups of people sit and, and analyze the text and come up with better better um, ideas about how to correctly translate it to whatever language they selected. That is an issue, obviously, but as, as Joseph Smith understood throughout, you know, as we look at the, the word translation in, in church history usage, translation is more consistent with transmitted. And so we believe the Bible to be the word of God insofar as it is correctly interpreted by our living prophet or by even anybody who's reading and interpreting the text. So it's not so much that we're concerned about whether or not the, the word in Greek and the word in English are, are correctly um, corollary, but more 
are you correctly establishing doctrine from what the text actually says? And I think that, that you know, we talk a lot about biblical literalists. And earlier we talked about how the, the Trinity um, is developed out of the text. The Trinity, the, the, the requirements of the Trinity, the actual components that are required to develop that doctrine are, are found nowhere in Scripture. And so with the idea that there is a, a triune God that is clearly taught in Scripture, it's not. I mean, anybody who reads the New Testament gets the understanding that there's a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost. The idea that they are some kind of co-substantial triunity is something that, that isn't contained in the text. And if that's the, trans, the translation that you are actually holding to, then that would be need to be much more explicit, or you're going to need to point to some other authoritative source, source outside of the text that, that teaches that doctrine and establishes it. And so we need to be, as Latter-day Saints, more careful about falling into the trap of, well, we believe the Bible and we're more focused about Greek to English. That's not the concern. The concern is, is just what we're doing here. It's sola scriptura is not taught in the scriptures. The Trinity isn't taught in the scriptures. That's the concern. Yeah, uh, I'm actually, I'm oh, so sorry, what are you saying? Oh, no, go ahead. Honestly, I, with, I mean, just with respect, I'm going to actually push back a little bit on that. Um, just because of the disagreement. Like, I think, yeah, actually, whether the translation is correct translation, I think that matters a whole lot. Like, whether it's like, I would, I would say, yeah, you really do need to focus on that. Because, like, even if you, like, do, like, to get, I think that in order to get, like, really correct doctrine, you really do have to get that translation like i mean there are some minor things but it's like oh no big deal but like i mean especially with like some like there could be some meat translations where it changes the meaning a lot and that mean that you can't interpret it right if you get some major like something like that where it really makes that big of a difference so i'd say that yeah the, the translation from like greek to hebrew i'd say that's a big deal and like i think that's actually prerequisite to getting you know a correct spiritual or correct doctrinal translation because if you got like a incorrect um, you know, form of it that's really changing passive significant. You can't really make a significant, you know, correct doctrinal thing. So I'd say that is. And then the one other thing, real quick, is with the prophetic um, interpretation. And at first, of all, I want to do preface this is absolutely the prophetic interpretation means a big deal with the apostles, how they interpret this big deal. But I, um, this might make it sound like a little, um, like, again, like I used to say in the apostles, I think, like, the, I don't think you can say, like, the prophetic, like, the interpretation is like the end all be all because there have been like they've gone back and they've like kind of reversed some of that stuff again like you go back with brigham young and adam god and how he's like interpreted stuff then that then we've like reversed that again i'm not saying that there's not like significant insight the prophets give but to say like oh that is the interpretation well they've they've reversed that sometimes and again like i mean i'm i believe in mormon i believe that all this stuff is true and i believe that they give spiritual insights but just saying like the debate is now over i would push back against that concept Adam God's published uh, that's gonna be up uh, right and so so again I, I think you misunderstood what I'm saying so obviously the translation I did state needs to be consistent and that is that is a, a concern we have to make sure that from the Greek and Hebrew it's translated correctly into whatever language which is what I stated also too I'm not talking about dead prophets the current prophet President Nelson is the one who is primarily authorized to interpret the texts. We're not going back to Brigham Young and determining what Brigham Young said. President Nelson is the one who sets the doctrine for the church, as has been historically consistent back through all the way to Adam um, with respect to doctrine. The living prophet is the one who, who is qualified and authorized to interpret scripture. So whatever Brigham Young said or John Taylor said, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't override or supersede the living prophet. It's never been that way. Well, yeah, the, the thing about that, though, is, and again, I'm trying to, and, and I don't want to come off as disrespectful here, so, like, again, just just because I disagree doesn't mean I, you know, I just want to make that clear first of all, but I also feel like, again, like, oh, yeah, you can say that, but it's sort of like, well, is that, like, in a few years, does that mean, well, you know, Nelson says, does that make that, like, irrelevant now, like, now, where is the point where it's like, oh, like, it's just, you can just sort of, like, oh, the current prophet, like, you know, whatever, like, where, because just because, like, Russell Nelson says something now, and like that's true. Does the truth change like ten years from now? Later, like I like I don't know. That's where I think it gets really messy. And again, like I'm not saying well, there's not some insight that comes from the prophet, uh, but I'm right. just saying like, the idea that it's like this is the correct. This is it. Like this is the thing. I I think that's kind of hard, especially since they've changed it in the past. And you can be like, oh well, the current one supersedes it. But it's like, yeah, well, did the, the, the truth just did like suddenly since you know 
Brigham Young talked about Iron God. Was that true then? And now that the Spencer W. Kimball kind of does it, does that mean you know, now we go back in time and now Adam God's not true anymore? Like, I feel like that's, again, I feel like it's either was or it wasn't. And again, I'm not saying there's not significant things. I, Brigham Young, I believe, is a prophet. I just think that this idea that, like, again, this is where I feel like this idea that the prophet speaks and that's it. And the prophet gives a lot of insight. He's called of God. But, like, I feel like that's where a lot of, honestly, a lot of faith prices come from. It's where it's like, there's a certain point where it's like, that can't really be true. They can give spiritual insight. You have significant thoughts. And, like, you take it say very seriously. But the idea is like, oh, the current one is, like, the one. And that is it. And there's, that's done. It's over. I feel like that's kind of hard to do when you look through church history. And I, I'm not saying that. And so, again, the, the, the pattern of revelation is the living prophet is the one who is authorized to interpret doctrine. So what you're indicating is, is that, um, yes, in 10 years from now, whoever is serving, serving as a prophet, because I doubt President Nelson's going to live that long, but whoever's the prophet in 10 years, if they change policy or they amend doctrine predicated on revelation or predicated on a new understanding or predicated on changes in social convention or changes in, in whatever, and they're applying the, the scriptures consistent with that, the needs of that people, and it looks different than what President Nelson is doing now, then yes, that would supersede what President Nelson does. That's the way it's always been. What you're proposing is, is that we should take each prophet and then go through and try to cherry pick what their teachings are and then try to determine which ones we think are true or not. The, the Lord in his grace has decided we don't have to do that. The living prophet makes that determination. That's his, that's his role. It's like saying what portions of Moses were actually something that should survive the fulfillment of the covenant in Christ. Well, what portions of the, the law of Moses should, should survive are revealed to us through the living prophets. So the apostles taught us what portions of those edicts and those those practices should have survived and so on through the prophets. That's that's the role and the measure of prophets. I'm not saying it's a one and done. And you, we can't have a position where a prophet is speaking and then we are saying, oh, but I'm going to go back through and, and, and make a conglomerate or some kind of a hybrid re regarding what I think and what I believe because then what you're doing is you're propping yourself up as the authority and that's not the prerogative of lay members of the church to do the prophet is the one who is specially commissioned to interpret doctrine interpret the scripture and lead the church well I think I, I think no like after we finish this series like a follow-up episode will be like um how LDS doctrine needs to be um um understood and how it originates and so forth um i'm working on the project for adam god um so maybe once that's published we can actually i'm excited that. for that yeah yeah i'm looking forward to it so maybe we can use that as like a dalton and off pint like say fall fallibility and other issues as well but like when it comes to say because he it, apparently uh, he'll be not the whole as far as he's translated correctly a la articles of fate age uh, as daniel noted Everyone, except maybe a King James only as like a very naive Protestant who doesn't understand like translation issues, everyone would actually agree with that. It's just like the extent to um, translation or interpretation, you know, that's being corrupted in some way or another. That's that's the real issue. Uh, everyone believes, and everyone would actually amen. Um, the Bible is true as far as it's been translated correctly. Um, you know. I'm sure Hazelden would say that the uh, the Bible is true, but the NWT, the New World Translation, is not being corrected. Is not a correct translation uh, in many portions, you know. Or like, I'm sure like uh, I doubt he knows Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic, but like um, James White, for instance, would actually agree. Like uh, there are certain portions of say the NIV that's being poorly translated in some areas of the King James that's being poorly translated as well, like Titus 2.13 or the Grand Full Scrubs construction for those familiar with Greek. So, um, yeah, um, it's not, it's not a purely Latter-day Saint understanding. You even see this in the, um, 1978 Chicago Bible statement on the uh, authority of the Bible and other things like that. And like, you know, as everyone knows, I'm Irish. Um, it, it's actually impossible to translate properly the Gospel of John, especially the prologue, into Irish, because we only have a past tense, a simple past tense, and if you actually go through the grammar of that prologue of John, uh, you have the imperfect and other things as well that can't be conveyed in Irish. 
<laughs> so um, it, it's it's kind of a, a bit of a mess when you're trying to you translate a very complex verbal language like Greek into like a very wooden simple language like Irish. Um, you know, so I know that for a fact working through like say unbelievable naif and other things as well. Um, so uh, again, um, yeah, we do believe the Bible be as far as these trans to be true as far as these translate correctly. I like the eight article of faith, but funny enough, if he were to be consistent and honest, he would believe the same thing as well. Unless, of course, he said he heard heard and uh, King James only as two things that the Apostle Paul spoke King James English. <laughs> but um, so, as far as it is translated correctly, and what's the assumption that it is not translated correctly? That it false. No, saying, that, that's not saying, saying that you believe the Bible to be true as far as he's translated correctly does not mean you do not believe none of it is translated correctly. No, we just mean that there's lots of translations. Make sure you pick a correct one. Yeah. Or even if you just want to apply it to the entirety of the Bible, simply saying you have a qualification you know, um, to it does not mean all of it's called into question. It's just like you have to be a... a um, you know, caveat lector, reader, beware. Simply saying, like, you believe the Bible to be true as it is, as far as it is translated correctly, does not mean you think functionally or in reality none of it has been translated correctly. Um, that that's that's deceptive. That's nonsense. Um, so no, uh, that's again. This kind of shows like this is not in, uh, for informed Latter Day Saints like any of us. It's more like um, trend, because of the old guilt by association, other fallacies here. Obviously, it's yes. it's clearly boundary mm -hmm. maintenance. And anyone else have any comments on this? Yeah, that, that honestly, of all the things that he said so far, that's one of the most disingenuous. And that's it's full of errors that it's been changed uh, over time. <laughs> Um, how many Latter-day Saints actually think that? Um, I'm sure so. A few, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure he talks yeah. to a few people outside of Temple Square once in a while who say, yeah, it's full of errors and everybody's mistranslated it. <laughs> well, my, my question to him is like, do you have a preferred translation? And say he goes with the NASB because I know James White loves that translation. Maybe he goes with that. Well, we all know the best one. Are, are there mistakes with the, the NIV? accurate translation? The NIV is the best <laughs> translation is the NIV. Yeah, but here's the thing, like, unless Chris, you believe that the, not just the originals, but like, say, the copies of the copies that the NIV, the NASB are based on, are also preserved from error, you would have to claim that there's been, even if there's like few and far between, some numerical issues and some other grammatical issues that have crept into the texts, not just in terms of translation, but like at the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic manuscript level as well. Like, even Norman Geisler, who until his death a few years ago was hardcore Inerrantist, inerrantist when it comes to the originals uh, in a book um, I forget the name of it at the moment I think um, but it was basically on biblical difficulties you know he basically said like uh, there's contradictions as a result of uh, problems when it comes to how ancients wrote n numbers no no not original to the autographs but like they crept into the manuscripts and there might be some other historical or grammatical issues that have crept into the manuscripts beyond the autographs, because the doctrine of inerrancy, at least historically, traditionally understood, is the autographs, i.e. what Paul wrote or dictated, or what the biblical authors wrote or dictated uh, when they received the biblical revelation, that was free from error. But that does not preserve mean that the, uh, the scribes who made the copies of the copies and so forth were given um, the gift of uh, preserving these texts. 100% perfectly. Now they would claim like God's providence allowed him to like preserve them with like n a very high level of uh, accuracy and consistent consistency and so forth. You know, uh, that's James White's position. He's like the King James only controversy and other conservative presence. But again, um, many many even like hardcore inerrantists for the autographs would admit, yeah, there's been at least some errors that have crept in, especially when it comes to the numbers in the Bible. Um, uh, as a result of, like, say, scribal issues and mistakes. Not necessarily always intentional, but sometimes accidental changes. So, I don't know. Anyone want to comment on that? Okay. So, yeah, there's a profession and belief in the Bible, but it's broken. Catholics do a uh, similar thing. 
Catholics historically have said, well, the Bible's dangerous, and so you can't interpret it, interpret it by yourself. Therefore, you need our organization. You need our... Um, Protestantism historically has always claimed that the community has played an important role in the interpretation of a text. And kind of knows like what he's trying to go into. Like it's the it's the stereotypical me and my Bible, and that's all required. But I really doubt he believes that, or like most Protestants don't believe that. They would believe it's not simply solo scripture. It's not me and my Bible under the tree. It's me, the Bible, but also the creeds and confessions and history as well. And and how my pastor preaches to me on Sunday. Yeah, which is not simply me and my Bible, but how he's trying to contrast again the guilt by association here you know the catholics you know um think it's dangerous if protestantism is the end result of solo scripture yeah it's dangerous but secondly no protestant like at least confessionally minded protestant like a reformed baptist or a historically minded presbyterian would agree with this it's not simply me and the bible you know that's the subjective strawman one often comes across when it comes to critics of solo scripture lds and otherwise um but he's, he seems like he's accepting this kind of uh, really silly, naive, and subjective, um, I, I can be the final determiner of doctrinal truth. Um, but if you read the confessions, like the Westminster Confession of Faith or the London Baptist Confession of Faith, they have a much higher view of the church, albeit the local church, you know, the ecclesiology, than this guy seems to have. Because they believe in the importance of, say, elders who are inspired, you know, in some way by the Spirit to proper interpret, properly handle the Word of God and so forth. So, kind of indicates like this guy probably has a very piss poor understanding of the local church, not just the universal church. Our organization to tell you what it's what it says. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, okay, so James, uh, how do you determine the meaning of a text of the Bible, and how do you know it's true and authoritative? Well, he does. I, I, I know the historical graphical method, but like uh, one can find out until the cows come home. Sorry, Daniel. I was just going to say. Well, I did. I think you guys kind of touched on that, but I did read the um, uh, the transcript of what he does say, and he does kind of go into like, oh, this is how we determined the Bible, books of the Bible. But again, like one thing again, I added, like you mentioned this before, is like you know, you know, when they took away certain books and stuff, how to like you know, post after they made it, you know, the seven books, and it was seven that Martin Luther took out. But I don't know, but he does go through the whole thing where it's like, oh, you know, you know, are they consistent? Is it orthodox? You know, were the authors there or something like that? You know, so he does, he does explain it. Yeah, but that seems to be a circular reason. Like, is it orthodox, i.e., does it agree with what I think it should say? No, that, that's another thing. It's like, it's like, it's like, like, it's a self-fulfilling thing. Orthodox yeah. is what I already, yeah. That, that's, yeah, yeah. That is, and that's, a, yeah, it's circular. But um, just like on the whole uh, translated correctly chain, I like I know like one text that's often used is like, say, the Isaiah 48 text, uh, you know, the word of God shall, you know, the preservation of God's word. I just came across this uh, in some of my notes, and I think it's apropos here. Um, this actually comes from a Reformed Presbyterian, uh, Gary Crampton, um, who's like a heavy hitter. He, he's deceased, but he was a heavy hitter in Reformed theological circles. He was very anti-Roman Catholic as well, so he wasn't like um, ecumenical. Um, he actually wrote on the whole Word of God equals the Bible fallacy or Isaiah 48. He's about the Bible and its preservation and so forth. Uh, there's a difference between the Word of God, which is eternal, Psalm 119, verses 89, 152, and 160, and the Bible, which is not. The Bible is the Word of God written. If one were to destroy one paper Bible, or all paper Bibles, he would not have destroyed the eternal word of God. One such example is given in Jeremiah 36. The prophet was told by God to write his words in the book and to read it to the people. Wicked King Yahakim, not comfortable with what had been written, had the written word destroyed. God then told the prophet to write the word down again. The king had destroyed the written word, but he had not destroyed God's word. God's word is eternal propositions, the fine expression in written statements. And that's from the book W. Gary Crampton, By Scripture Alone, The Sufficiency of Scripture, page 156, and it was actually endorsed by Robert L. Raymond. Um, he was a heavy hitter in Reformed theological circles as well, more so than Crampton. But, um, yeah, I kind of know, like, if someone's going to be watching this and they're a and they say, well, Isaiah 48, or the parallel text in one of the Petrine letters about the Word of God, and you know, always uh, being preserved and so forth. It's like, no, it's not about the written word, it's about God's word, you know. Um, and also, an all or nothing approach to those verses would mean that there's been no textual variation in any of the manuscripts at all, which of course is absurd, but yeah. But yeah, um, I kind of flick through like some, some of the transcripts and it's, it's the common circular, is it orthodox, i.e. does agree with what I think it should uh, teach and all this um, malarkey as well. Um, but yeah. 
do a similar thing. On the surface, they'll say that they only believe in the 66 books of the Bible, but the reality is, is their Watchtower Bible and Tract uh, Society is similar to the Book of Mormon in that it's additional scripture. That um, I don't know too much about Jehovah's Witnesses. I have no real interest in JW theology. I'm more interested in, say, Christadelphians and other 19th century groups. But I'm unaware of like, Jehovah's Witnesses actually think that the Watchtower Society, or at least its publications, are God inspired scripture. Now, Maybe someone else here has actually studied the JWs um, in more depth, but someone uh, else maybe they don't think the New World magazines and stuff like that are. Now they'll use them as it's, aids, it's, but they don't think they're they're actually right. It's no different world. than reading. It's no different than reading a biblical commentary. It just tells you the Jehovah's Witnesses' interpretations of the Bible, and and to accuse somebody of of adding to Scripture because they're interpreting it and writing articles. I mean every religious organization that uses the bible on the planet writes articles and interpretations of passages and then he's basically equating that just for the jehovah's witnesses as scripture which it isn't and also like notice the books i don't know he's read many of them but the books in the background i'm sure they give like the niv commentary series that commentates and gives opinions and like um of varying degrees of quality on the bible does that mean that james hazelton does not actually believe in solo scripture because he thinks the niv uh, application commentary series is god breathes scripture <laughs> well i mean oh so the only thing is that i don't know how and i was actually talking about this how hardcore they take um watchtower interpretation i mean if it's like i mean you can read like an interpretation like a commentary and you can be like oh you know it, it take it really seriously, but you don't take it seriously like scripture. Like, you know, maybe this is wrong, you know, something like that. Yeah, I kind of like look around and like take things into consideration, not like scripture. Where it's like, oh, this is, you know, God exactly, like this commentary. But like maybe Jehovah's Witnesses do take the Watchtower like that. I don't know. That may not be true, but um, maybe that's where yeah. coming from. Yeah. So, um, so they, they, they use it in their meetings. So they have meetings very consistent with what we used to do. So um, they use the Watchtower probably pretty consistent with the way that we use a conference talk in in Sunday school meetings where we review the conference talk teachings. But predominantly, I mean, the apostles who are teaching a general conference, what they're doing is interpreting the scriptures. And then we're just reading their words as they're interpreting the scriptures. So, not so would it be fair to say that GWs believe that they're, it's authoritative, but not necessarily like, say, adding to the canon or God? Well, it's, it's just their official interpretations are disseminated through the Watchtower Tribal Bible and Tract Society. That's that's their their governing body that, that sets the standard for their doctrine. Their doctrine, though, they would never argue that that is other than their correct interpretation of the scripture, which everybody claims. I mean, yeah, nobody claims... Well, uh, we have our interpretation, but it's not correct. It's it's subject to scrutiny. They would okay. say this is the correct interpretation. Yeah, I just asked because like I live in the middle of nowhere in rural Ireland, so like we never get Jehovah's Witnesses here, and so, um, and I've never really been bothered to actually study JW theology beyond reading some books by Greg Stafford. So, yeah, no, yeah. So something I would compare the JW Watchtower to is like the Liahona that we have in our church where it's like our church leaders will write an article about different things and, um, you know, we'll read it in church and we'll read it in our homes and stuff. Um, that's probably the closest I would, I would, um, yeah, put it basically. Okay. Well, in every church, every church produces materials like that. Every, every ecclesiastical organization produces some form of materials that goes through and, and cites passages and, and cites them for a specific purpose and tells the congregation what they believe. Okay. But I would yeah. say it does make a difference how seriously you have to take that interpretation. Like there's differences where it's like, oh, this is like a really cool, this is really insightful, but you, like, you know, we could disagree with that. Maybe it is true, maybe it's not to like, this is like the correct interpretation. So depending on how seriously they take that, again, I don't really know, but I'm just saying if they take it to like, this is basically the Bible interpretation, then I can see where he's coming from on that because sure. if it's like that. But if it's like sort of like something, you know, less than that, then yeah, that would be a bit of a straw man. Well, the, the fact that like he hasn't really got that many things correct, even uh, when it comes to Roman Catholicism, not just Mormonism, it it, it kind of make, gives me pause to like how accurate he's for, uh like well, I, but using that argument, the problem with it is, is that if you were to sit down and ask James who officially has the responsibility to interpret scripture, I mean, he already has said that the individual believer does. 
So if the individual believer has the responsibility and everybody within the church is entitled to read the biblical text and interpret them however they feel is appropriate, again, first of all, you're, you're establishing a church entirely based on subjectivity and feelings and anecdotal interpretations of the scripture, which I don't think is a basis for any kind of a, that's not a basis for a, a community, but ultimately the, the, he's going to say that he is a pastor, so he gets to do it. Oh, well, that would make him the him the Book of Mormon for his church. So the argument becomes self defeating in that way. So and again, it kind of begs the question, like when it comes to like important doctrinal debates, like well, I'm sure like who, someone who settles them. Do. Yeah, and, and we're not talking about like minor issues, like you know, uh, should you wear a tie to church or something like that? You know, it's more like is is baptism the instrumental means of regeneration? Again, and that's a real debate that's been going on way in Protestantism for 500 years. You have Lutherans and Anglicans saying one thing, and you have, like I'm sure, James here and many of his ilk, like low church evangelicals and Reformed Baptists claiming, no, that baptism regeneration is false, and maybe even the theological heresy. So, That is the source uh, that they turn to to understand what the Bible says. So it's, in a sense, in addition to uh, the canon. So they would certainly believe in an open canon uh, as well. Yeah, using that logic, like a lot of creeds and confessions we in Protestantism, some of which I'm sure he would agree with, substantially, are also adding to uh, the canon as well. Um, it's it's not a good argument here. And then there's a fourth commonality to all groups that believe in an open canon is that the Bible is uh, uh, subservient to the organization, the Bible. Um, well, we already had five minutes, so like maybe we should just like close here because it's almost two hours. But I will just say, like, everyone, go to Acts fifteen and ask who or what is the final decision maker as to um, Gentile inclusion in the New Covenant and the non-requirement of circumcision. And it's not the use of Amos nine eleven; it's ultimately an ecclesiastical act um, that results in the cessation of circumcision as a requirement for Gentile inclusion into the New Covenant. It's um, just reading Acts 15 kind of shows, functionally speaking, Scripture is an authority, but it's not the only authority. Um, and you're going to see this play out in Acts 15. So, but um, we're going to hit, like, say, wanna... five minutes. So, Daniel, I'll let you speak, but, like, um, maybe what we should do is, like, end it here because it's almost been two hours now. And okay, maybe, yeah. Maybe we can actually start at this point maybe like next week or whenever we can actually get most of us back again uh, because the, it's going to take a while to go through all of it but I think yeah. it might, it's going to be a fun stuff to do but it's also going to be like a useful discussion because we're kind of discussing like logical fallacies and also like uh, some assumptions um, that are going to like the solo scripture in the LDS position but yeah I'll let you kind of uh, discuss that okay so I just want to go real quick but this is like again because I, I was when I was reading the transcript I was actually thinking about this part where he's like like all of our like unique stuff is subservient to the Bible I just think that's such a honestly and you know with all due respect to him I think that's such like an echo chamber like level of logic here because it's sort of like oh if you don't believe the Bible is it then it's all subservient and like the truth is yeah there is ways that we look at the Bible that are like you know that we wouldn't look at it if we didn't have our unique stuff our unique you know extra biblical stuff but at the same time you could put that in reverse like you'd be like this way when we look at our stuff our unique stuff because of what's said in the Bible the Bible also like kind of influences the way we look at the Book of Mormon the way we look at Doctrine and Covenants um and even like really pushes the way it moves in a lot of stuff like a lot of stuff in the Doctrine and Covenants wouldn't be there without the Bible and a lot of the ways we interpret different scripture is so it goes both ways and again like again this kind of goes to the whole concept where it's like you know when richard bushman said you know to joseph smith um the uh you know the bible was a gate it wasn't a fence it's like it's not like it's again i don't know what the thing would be for being subservient but the idea is like you know you can go in and out of it and it affects it both ways it's it's not this thing where it's like you know the bible is like you know second it's like it it, it all affects each other it's not like the bible is like you know it, it just it just comes from this idea like if you have any separate interpretation that's in, influenced by some extra vocal thing then it just it just automatically the bible's absurd which is not true because it goes both ways i agree with you. it's fallacious reasoning just because you don't believe in soul scripture does not mean ipso facto the bible is always going to be subservient in every single issue that comes up um no that's silly um but yeah you're, you're absolutely correct and it's like yeah we do subordinate the bible we, we also subordinate the doctrine columns book of mormon and pearl of great price to god ultimately you know, because God is the ultimate source of scripture and other sources of truth. You know, so um, you know, 
functionally speaking, Protestants have ass backwards, as we say here. <laughs> but yeah, I agree with you. Like, um, it, it's it's getting the whole guilt by association there, and the whole false piety you often find when Protestantism is like, well, you know, we, you know, we have. You know, we privilege the Bible onto like the real level, you know, as it should be. And if you disagree with us, ipso facto, you know, you have a very low view of um, scripture and the Bible and so forth. Again, the, which kind of hints for me, like this video is not really for Latter day Saints. It's more like for boundary maintenance between already convinced Protestants who think Mormonism is like this anti biblical cult, you know, so like you can actually make sure like there's no sheep stealing or whatever. Um, now, we've already gone through, like, the first five minutes, but, like, hopefully uh, it will actually improve. But, like, um, skimming through the uh, transcript, it's more like um, the Mormons are wrong, and that's just, like, the bold assertion made left, right, and center of uh, ultra the transcription. But, uh, yeah. So, any final comments from you uh, guys before we uh, end things? Okay, well, we went through the first five minutes, but, like, although it's only five minutes and about two hours, like, I think we kind of covered a lot of uh, very important presuppositions here and other issues. Like, maybe, like, we can actually aim to do this maybe again uh, next week or whenever. Uh, we'll actually try to arrange a time, but, like, um, even even if it takes, like, a few sessions, like, it, it might be a useful tool for, like, missionaries and others who are wondering about... Because it's not simply, like, say, scripture. You know, there's, like, loads of presuppositions that go into, like, say, sola scriptura, but also criticisms of Sola Scriptura, like how to actually articulate them properly and consistently and so forth. So, um, yeah. Um, so hopefully we can do this again, like a uh, part two, like either next uh, week or the week after, um, seeing how things plan out for all of us. But yeah, um, really do appreciate like, uh, your, um, all of you guys actually, uh, staying for like the two hours and Travis, you just had to bail a few minutes ago. And again, hi, Travis Morgan. <laughs> so uh with that uh we'll just end the uh recording but hopefully we'll have like a part two uh sometime uh, in the next week or two so